Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the 2022 AmCham Doing Business in Korea seminar. We will first hear opening remarks from Chairman and CEO of the American Chamber of Commerce in Korea, Mr. James Kim. Please give him a big round of applause. Good morning. What an amazing morning today. Uh, thank you so much for coming to our fourth annual Doing Business in uh, Korea seminar. You know, for me, it's so uh, exciting to see so many prominent uh, government and business leaders of both countries, the United States and Korea. But before we get the program officially started, I wanted to especially thank uh, a few people. First, and this is very special for, for me and for all of us, His Excellency, Mr. Park Jin. In fact, I'd appreciate if you would stand, Mr. Park Jin. <clears throat> you know, he is a four-term National Assemblyman. And as a lot of you know, <clears throat> He is the foreign minister nominee for President-elect Yoon sung yeol He could be the most sought after uh, person here in South Korea today, given the magnitude of the job he's gonna have. So for us, we're so grateful that uh, he's here to really uh, watch our webinar or seminar in action. And I'm very, very, you know, thankful that he's here today. I consider Pak Jin a very good personal friend and someone who I think could be the best foreign minister that I've ever had a chance to work with here in South Korea. So again, Mr. Pak Jin, uh, we wish you well. I think you're going to do a terrific job. So let's give him another round of applause, please. <clears throat> <clears throat> we also have another very, very special uh, guest who is uh, joining us live uh, via video. This is not pre recorded. He's here live with us. The Honorable uh, John Ossoff, the U.S. Senator for Georgia, and he's here with us today. You know, Amchem had the, had the pleasure of uh, hosting Senator Ossoff when he was here in November last year. And his passion to drive U.S.-Korea collaboration, especially for SMEs, is really critical and very, very encouraging. I'm going to give him an official introduction when we start the official program. I also want to thank... Uh, the Honorable Christopher Del Corso. He's our Chargé of the Affairs at the U.S. Embassy Seoul. I actually think he's my most important stakeholder here in, in, in this room. So despite the big names here, Chris, you're my number one, okay? You know, under his leadership, uh, you know, the U.S. Korea relations are constantly reaching new heights, and the AmCham community really appreciates all he has done. So thank you so much. We also have another very special guest with us, uh, and this is kind of a rare appearance, is uh, Mr. Walter Cho. He's the chairman and CEO of Hanjin Group and Korean Airlines. I'm sure all of us have taken Korean Airlines. I really think that since he took over Korean Airlines, he's a true leader in the global aviation industry. And he's been instrumental in uh, amplifying the air passenger and cargo traffic between the two countries. So again, it resonates so nicely with our event today. Okay? So if you ever have challenges or concerns with Korean Air, he's the man you talk to. <laughs> okay? We also have another interesting speaker uh, who's going to be joining us, uh, not live, but it's pre-recorded, is the president of International for New York Times. In fact, uh, He's going to really cover four questions, right? One, why is he leaving Hong Kong as a New York Times regional headquarters? Why Korea? What has he experienced so far in Korea? 
And lastly, any good messages for the future uh, President Yoon elect administration. So I think that's going to be a very powerful dialogue. And lastly, I want to thank uh, you know Congressman Jay Kim. Please stand up, Mr. Jay Kim. <clears throat> Jay Kim, believe it or not, is <clears throat> he's a real pioneer, right? He's the first. Korean American to be elected as a U.S. congressman in our history. So he's paved the way for a lot of Korean Americans to uh, you know, become elected in the United States. So thank you very much. You know, today's seminar is uh, something that we can all learn from. Uh, and I'm going to just get straight to our guest of honor who will speak about the uh, U.S.-Korea partnership. So let me formally introduce uh, Senator Ossoff. You know, it's obviously evening for him in, in, uh, in Georgia. Uh, senator Ossoff, for those who don't know, is a senior U.S. senator from the state of Georgia. In his first year in office, Senator Ossoff has established himself as a pragmatic and a level-headed leader when it comes to international relations and especially building U.S.-Korea relations. In November of 2021, uh, he led a historic delegation uh, to South Korea. During his visit, he met with, uh, with the AmCham delegation, and I thought we had a terrific you know, conversation to expand the partnership between the two countries. And I know it's late for Senator Ossoff in, in Georgia, but for me, what a great honor it is to have you here with us today. And thank you so much for joining us live. So without further delay, Senator Ossoff, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, James, for that very kind introduction. It's an honor uh, to join you for this event. Greetings from Atlanta, Georgia, where indeed it is evening. I wanna recognize the AmCham leadership, uh, Charge d'Affaires del Corso, who uh, was a uh, tremendous partner for the delegation that I led to the Republic of Korea uh, last autumn. Congressman Kim, uh, Mr. Cho, distinguished visitors, guests, all speakers and panelists, thank you for your efforts to make this event a success and to strengthen the commercial ties, the warm relations and the critical alliance between the Republic of Korea and the United States. It is such a pleasure to have this opportunity to speak directly with the men and women of Korea's vibrant business community. Uh, you drive so much of the extraordinary cooperation between our two countries. I, I wanna begin by extending warm congratulations to the Korean people for once again demonstrating the power and responsibility that the people hold in your democracy. I want to uh, congratulate President-elect Yoon. I had the opportunity to sit down with then candidate Yoon, now president-elect Yoon, uh, when I visited Korea last fall. I greatly appreciated his candor, uh, his uh, deep support for the US-Korea alliance, uh, which is vital to regional and global security. Uh, and I was pleased to meet as well with the delegation that the president-elect dispatched to Washington earlier this month, led by my friends, Dr. Park, and Representative Cho. And these conversations I know are just the beginning of what will be a strong and enduring relationship between me and my office, the US Senate and the United States with the UN administration to deepen cooperation across the full breadth of our alliance, security, economic, diplomatic, technological. Uh, and I understand that Dr. Park, who may soon be Foreign Minister Park is here today demonstrating the UN administration's recognition of the importance of economic ties between the United States and South Korea and the importance of AmCham. And speaking of AmCham, James, I wanna commend you again, Jeff Jones and your entire team for all of the tireless work that you do to strengthen commercial ties between our two nations. Uh, the hospitality that you showed and more importantly, the work that you did to ensure that the historic delegation I led last fall was a success is deeply appreciated. 
I don't need to convince anybody in this room, but the U.S.-South Korea alliance is critical to peace, stability, and prosperity in Northeast Asia, in the Indo-Pacific region, and around the world. Uh, and the deep and rich and vitally important economic ties between our countries are a critical part of that alliance. That's one of the reasons that I urged President Biden last December to nominate an ambassador to South Korea. He, of course, subsequently nominated Ambassador Philip Goldberg. Uh, I have urged my colleagues on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to quickly schedule his nomination hearing. Uh, they held that hearing on April 7th, and I will continue to press for his swift confirmation. The team at the embassy in Seoul is extraordinary. I know that they are eager to welcome a new ambassador to lead their efforts. You know, when I visited Korea last fall, I had the pleasure of meeting with AmCham leaders, including the board uh, and uh, those who represent Georgia companies present in Korea. Uh, Ms. Choi from Coca-Cola Korea, uh, Mr. Corchio from Delta Airlines, Mr. Lang from Lockheed Martin and others. And those meetings really highlighted how vital the relationship between my state, Georgia, and South Korea is. Here, for example, uh, where we host uh, the largest solar module manufacturer in the Western Hemisphere. That's a Hanwha uh, investment in my state at their Q-Cells factory. We in Georgia are the home of Kia's only manufacturing plant in the United States. Uh, and within a year, SK Innovation will be producing enough batteries in my state of Georgia for 430,000 U.S.-made vehicles per year. These companies have other, have, and others have recognized that my state offers unique assets and opportunities for Korean companies. And I'm going to continue to work to attract Korean investment in the state of Georgia. And for those Korean entrepreneurs, investors, and business leaders who are present, please just reach out to my office uh, and we will open every door that we can to support your efforts to invest in the United States and to invest in Georgia. I'll close just with this. Uh, I want to recognize all of the U.S. companies that are uh, doing business in Korea. Uh, many more, I believe, can be persuaded to make Korea their regional headquarters. I look forward to engaging with AmCham uh, to expand, expand commerce and investment in both directions. And fostering these kinds of economic linkages takes creative and forward-looking and visionary policymaking. That's why I have partnered with uh, my Republican colleague, Senator Roy Blunt, uh, on the Partner with Korea Act that I've co-sponsored. Uh, to create 15,000 visas, opportunities for Korean nationals to work in highly specialized jobs in the United States. It will take smart policy, it will take innovation, like AmCham Korea's latest service, the American Business Center, which will be a vital resource for U.S. companies that are seeking opportunities in Korea. I will remain a champion for U.S.-Korea relations in the U.S. Senate. Please reach out to my office so together we can explore opportunities to deepen this vital alliance, deepen commercial relationships, technological cooperation uh, for a, a, a more peaceful, a more sustainable, a more prosperous, and a healthier world. I look forward to working with you all. Kachi, Kapshida, and Komsamida. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Senator Ossoff. We will move on to the next session. We're honored to have with us Chargé d'Affaires at Interim at the U.S. Embassy Seoul, the Honorable Christopher Del Corso. Please help me welcome him to the stage. So good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank Jim for again, your great introduction and hosting this event. I want to uh, also thank the Honorable Representative Dr. Park. You know, thank you for your time here today and all that you're doing to lead the transition to the new administration. And as many people have said, congratulations on your nomination to be the next foreign minister. I also am looking to work with you in your new capacity as we move forward in a, a present new administration. I was going to offer my congratulations to uh, the Honorable Senator Ossoff. Um, hopefully we'll get him back. But again, thank him for his participation virtually in this timely seminar 
And we very much look forward to his commitment in building a stronger Korea-U.S. ties. And we also look forward to hopefully his next visit to Seoul, although we're not sure when that might be, to continue the great work that he did starting last autumn. I also want to thank all the AmCham members and companies, as well as the other distinguished guests that we have here today. Thank you for asking me to participate in this important event. May is a particularly noteworthy month here, and we're not only uh, celebrating the 140th anniversary of ties between the United States and Korea, but it'll also be when we welcome President-elect Yoon and his administration to office, again, celebrating the vibrant democracy that we have here in Korea. Diplomatic relations between our two nations that began back in 1882 grew not only into a very close, ironclad, watertight military alliance, but also into a forward-looking, uh, robust commercial and economic partnership. Almost 70 years ago, we began crafting one of the most steadfast, resilient, and robust alliances that the world has seen. But now is our task to continue to expand and adapt to new challenges. We must work together as a force of good around the globe to improve the lives of others. Just last month, we celebrated the 10th anniversary of the Korea-U.S. Free Trade Agreement, which has served as a key pillar to our growing global partnership. And I do want to take a moment and mention that one of the key figures of the approval of course in the National Assembly is the Honorable Dr. Park Chin. And if you ever want to hear really great stories <laughs> about how a democracy works in a legislative process, he can tell you about the difficult times, but the good times he had to get that agreement signed. Again, talking about the two-way trade and investment that has flourished over these 10 years since the agreement has been signed, last year, bilateral trade in goods and services reached an all-time high between our two countries of $194 billion, even as the world was dealing with the corona pandemic. Over the same 10-year period, Korea has invested in the United States has more than tripled to $64 billion, and published plans by Korean firms will show that that number will reach close to $100 billion within the next five to seven years. As for the Korean market, Korea offers U.S. investors and exporters political stability, public safety, world-class infrastructure, highly skilled workforce, and a dynamic private sector. I'm amazed every day by the rapidly expanding Korea-U.S. business partnership in a vast array of fields. Last year, Korean and U.S. firms committed tens of billions of dollars in joint ventures in investment in critical areas like semiconductors, high-capacity batteries, renewable energy, and a broader supply chains of materials, parts, and equipment. Korea is on the cusp of leading the digital revolution with a workforce that is a unique genius of innovation. In fact, the Korean government is actively supporting the startup ecosystem, providing training, workspace, funding, and introductions to business leaders. The world needs us to work together as we push progress on things such as the digital economy, biotechnology, and the responsible use of artificial intelligence. We are natural partners in areas that our citizens care most about, like clean energy technology, higher education, and sustainable agriculture. But it will take innovation of Korean and U.S. companies and the support of our two governments to achieve our goals. We must continue our cooperation in the Indo-Pacific as uh, the focus on the digital and emerging technologies, supply chain resilience, infrastructure, clean energy, and decarbonization. We are looking to partners like Korea to join us 
in leading such cooperation through the newly announced Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. This is why it's important that we align our regulatory frameworks with global standards so they can facilitate innovation and economic expansion. Korea is a technology leader. However, recent legislation in the National Assembly regarding the digital economy may have some unintended consequences of signaling to foreign entities that their innovation and investment may not be welcome here. As, as you've heard, as Ambassador Officer touched on, Ambassador Philip Goldberg, who is President Biden's nominated, nominee to be the next U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Korea, had his confirmation hearing in front of the Senate earlier this month. During the hearing, Ambassador Goldberg highlighted that the United States needs and welcomes a global Korea. Not only to tackle some of the most pressing challenges of the 21st century, but also to seize on the century's greatest opportunities. If confirmed by the Senate, Ambassador Goldberg promised to work together with President-elect Jun and his administration and the Korean people on a shared vision of an open and free Indo-Pacific and a world that's dominated by international rule-based order, democratic principles, and respect for universal human rights. So I echo Ambassador Goldberg's sentiment, and I look forward to working with all of you who are here today to continue to strengthen our alliance and our global partnership. And again, I want to thank AmCham for hosting this important event and this very useful seminar. Kinsamida. Thank you very much. Now we will hear, hear remarks from Mr. Walter Cho, Chairman and CEO of Hanjin Group and Korean Air. Please give a big round of applause to Mr. Cho. Senator Ossoff, Minister of Foreign Affairs nominee Park Jin, Acting Ambassador Chris Del Corso, I'm Chem Chairman James Kim, and ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be able to address you today on investing in the UN USA. I would like to thank James Kim for the opportunity to be here today. And I would also like to express my sincere appreciation for Senator Ossoff making the time to share his thoughts with us. We appreciate his passion for the US-Korea relationship. Special thanks also to nominee Park Chin for being with us today. This is a particularly important time for the new administration and we are grateful for Assemblyman Park's presence. We are also very appreciative of Acting Ambassador Chris Del Corso's dedication to the U.S.-Korea relationship and for his service to both nations. Korean Air is proud of our connection with the United States, and we are very appreciative of the environment in the U.S. that permits us to contribute to the growth of the U.S.-Korea economic relationship. Prior to the COVID pandemic, Korean Air flew more than 2.9 million passengers annually to the U.S. and subsequent to the onslaught of the pandemic, we have increased our cargo capacity to help relieve the supply chain issue facing both economies. By increasing our cargo capacity to the U.S. to more than 900,000 tons in 2021, making Korean Air one of the largest car cargo carriers to the United States and contributing greatly to economic, ec economic activity in the U.S. Currently, Korean Air is responsible for the direct and indirect employment of more than 75,000 jobs in the U.S., which together with the tourism and business traffic brought to the U.S. and the operation of our hotels in the U.S., results in approximately 18 billion U.S. dollars in direct and indirect consumption in the U.S. In addition, Korean Air's fleet consists primarily of Boeing aircraft, and we have purchased from the U.S. aircraft and parts exceeding 34 billion U.S. dollars. As you can see, Korean Air is committed to the U.S.-Korea economic relationship, and the U.S. is by far our most important economic partner. 
We are now in the process of acquiring Asian Airlines, which incurred significant financial difficulties. And by acquiring this airline, we will be able to increase our contribution to the U.S. economy and prevent the losses to both nations if this airline were to cease operations. We have received approval from the Korean antitrust authorities to proceed with the acquisition, and we are now awaiting approval from the U.S. Korean Air operates in many jurisdictions around the world, so we are able to compare the investment and regulatory environment in many nations. We are committed to increasing our activity in the U.S. given the positive environment, and we will continue to be a major contributor to the U.S.-Korea economic relationship. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and I would encourage all of you to look carefully at opportunities in the U.S. I am confident you will find your investment activity in the U.S. as profitable and worthwhile as we are Korean Air have, have, and we look forward to continuing and expanding our investments in the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we will be watching a special interview between Chairman and President of G Chairman and President James Kim and President International of the New York Times Company, Stephen Dunbar Johnson, featuring on the topic of Korea as Asia's regional headquarters, the New York Times experience. Hey, Stephen, it's always a pleasure uh, you know, seeing you. Uh, I know that every time you come to Korea, we have a chance to see each other in person. But uh, obviously, since we're not able to have you here in person, this technology is fantastic for us to have a, a good conversation. Today is a very big uh, event for Hanshan because one of our missions is to help make Korea a regional headquarters uh, in Asia. And obviously, the New York Times is a great example. So let me just, you know, get right to the point. Uh, you obviously decided to move your Asian digital hub from Hong Kong to Korea last May. What were the main drivers for the move? And from your perspective, what does Korea offer as a regional business hub? Well, well, James, let me just start by thanking you for, for inviting me to, to join this very august um, meeting. I'm very sorry I'm not there um, in person. Um, I'm very much looking forward to being in, uh, in Seoul next week. Um, I'm sorry the timing didn't work out that I couldn't be there in person, but, um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing you in person. Um, so to your question, um, the, the main driver was, was, um, was China and Hong Kong. Um, and those two things are, are, are intrinsically linked. Uh, we had been in, in Hong Kong for many years. Um, it was our Asian base. Um, we had decided on Hong Kong for a number of reasons. Um, one of the most vibrant international cities on earth, uh, fabulous communications. Um, but first and foremost, it was a great place to practice free independent journalism. Um, so that was the reason why we were in Hong Kong, the Chinese national security law, but even preceding the Chinese national security law, we were beginning to see indications that um, there was going to be a real tightening on the freedom of press in, in Hong Kong. And um, with the advent of the Chinese uh, security law and the ambiguity around that, what it me meant, we felt that it was really time that the writing was on the wall uh, for Hong Kong in terms of it being a city for where you could practice free independent journalism. Um, and we um, triggered a plan to move, a plan that I put in place actually a couple of years earlier, just as a contingency to, given what we were seeing in, um, in Hong Kong. So that was really the, the main driver. And why did you uh, select Korea? Well, we'd gone, as I said, we, we were already um, looking at a contingency plan uh, for a couple of years. And, and I, I worked with a few of my colleagues to um, look right across the region. Um, and we, we sort of categorized it in a number of areas. The most important category was independence of, of the press. Um, number one, and that was the most heavily weighted category. Then we went into other things like um, communications, uh, visas, uh, schooling, um, 
uh, the, the, just um, yeah, into um, the the hub for travel, um, in ease of getting in and out, and business conditions in the in the market. So we looked at all of these things um, and give them, gave them different weightings. Um, and it was a rather methodical, um, but I think actually pretty effective um, scoring card. Um, and Seoul came out top um, quite convincingly, actually. Mm -hmm. But really, the weight to, for us, the biggest priority was, do we feel that this is going to be a market where you can practice um, uh, journalism without fear or favor? which is, is always the most important thing for the New York Times. I'm sure the Korean government is very happy to hear your responses. Uh, you know, Stephen, just uh, you know, a month and a half ago, we, we being AmSham, completed a business survey. And Korea, believe it or not, was voted the second most preferred destination as a regional headquarters in Asia. Singapore was number one, uh, followed by you know, Japan, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and China in that order. And Korea was right after Singapore. Uh, you've now been operating uh, your business here in Korea. Uh, what has your experience been like so far? It's been really very positive. Uh, and I have to say, James, not, not just because I'm, I'm talking to you um, as, as head of AmCham in South Korea, but I, I genuinely would like to thank you and the chamber for, for your efforts and your welcome because you've been a massive help to us um, from the beginning um, and that has been a reflection also of our general experience in Korea to date um, where we found it very easy to do business um, to set up there um, and right and incredibly important things about the how to to, uh, to ensure that our staffs can can find good schooling for their children and, and settling in quickly frankly um, it was a, it was a smooth setup. The experience of the team there is is, is good, um, very positive. We have uh, when you go into the Seoul office, it is feels like a genuine adjunct of the New York Times in in New York. It, it has that feel, and we're all very pleased with our experience so far today. That's great. You know, we obviously have a new administration uh, kind of coming in on May tenth, and. Uh, Actually, at this audience, we have uh, the, the new Minister of Foreign Affairs nominee, Mr. Park Jin, with us. And I think he's going to be one of the best foreign ministers that uh, we might have ever had. So we're all very, very optimistic about the new administration. And all the things you're saying, I think, are really, really positive. That said, uh, there must be some improvements that uh, could be made. And uh, with your wisdom, if you could uh, share some of those opportunities for President Legune to uh, consider, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's, there are always improvements to be made like in any business and I think in any policy. Um, it's, it's quite difficult to make judgments, so particularly given the fact that, you know, our timing, um, whilst I, all I said I stand by has been extremely positive, our experience has been extremely positive. Don't forget the timing of our, our arrival was very much coincided with the pandemic. So um, it, it's not, hasn't been normal times. We've got lockdowns and restrictions and that has been difficult for us given, you know, the ability to get in and out of the, of, of the, of the country. Um, so to make a fully, I think when, when, when we let, we have a more stable environment and more normalized environment, I'd be, have a, probably a better, um, a better rounded, um, response to your to your question. I think one of the things that we are concerned about is um, after a few years is, is, is the tax situation for our employees, our, our expat employees in particular. Obviously, we, we by the way, we're, we're, we're hiring a lot of locals um, in Korea. We've really trying to, 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 our policy is to do that wherever we possibly can. But the very function of, of who we are as, as, as a, a US uh, and international news organization, we're going to have a multicultural staff. And in order to attract the best people, you need also to have a tax regime which is res responsive to that uh, environment. Um, and and the, other, the other thing we're concerned about is, is having sort of a, a very significant increase in tax after a period of, uh, of two or three years. So th th that, is, that is a cloud on the horizon for us. But um, generally speaking, I mean, I, I'd like to be able to answer that question, uh, having seen uh, uh, in a pandemic-free environment, 
um, because I'll, I'll give a more educated uh, guess. But that, that's the only thing that I can I can currently think of. Also, setting up the banking system it, that's that's difficult everywhere in the world today in today's environment for, for often for good reasons. But we found that a little bit cumbersome, I think, right at the beginning. Um, so those are the only two two issues. Other than that, I, I, I really do th say that it's been a very positive experience. Wow, you know, I think uh, in this short period of time, uh, you gave us such a clear, succinct, uh, you know, answers to, I think the questions that so many people have about you and the New York Times. Uh, at AmCham, we plan on writing directly to uh, President-elect uh, Yoon about some of the big challenges and opportunities that our board, you know, you know has shared here in Korea. And uh, I hope that uh, President Yoon, once he takes office, will help execute some of those uh, opportunities, especially on some of the matters that you discussed. So Stephen, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, next week. And I know that uh, we're gonna continue to do a lot of things together that's a win-win. And I always tell our member companies, please subscribe to the New York Times. They have great content, and we always want every one of our member companies to support the New York Times. Thank you so much, Stephen. Okay. Uh, I'm very much look forward to seeing you next week in person. And um, I, again, I'm sorry I'm not there um, to join you in the meeting uh, physically, um, but I also would like to repeat what I said earlier and thank the chamber and you in particular for all the, the, your, your sign very significant help to us since, um, since we decided to move to Korea. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now resume with the seminar. We will, move, we will be moving on to the next segment of the day, the Fireside Chat. The Fireside Chat will be moderated by Mr. James Kim, President and Chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce, and he will be joined by four experts, Mr. Chung Jong Young, Director General for Cross-Border Investment Policy from the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy, Mr. Kevin Peters, Managing Director of MSD Korea, Mr. Mark Lee, CVP and President of Applied Materials Korea, and Mr. Yi Young Sang, Vice President of Legal Affairs at Kupang. Please help me welcome our participants to the stage. I hope that everybody really liked the, uh, you know, the beginning session today. You know, this is really special to, to actually have you know, Senator Ossoff with us live. Uh, obviously, you know, hopefully the new Minister of Foreign Affairs, Park Jin, uh, Chris Del Corso, uh, you know, Korean Alliance Chairman and CEO Walter Cho. So for me, this is a really, really special session. And I think that uh, Stephen Dunbar Johnson from the New York Times summarized it very nicely why Korea is a great place to establish the regional headquarters. And I know we have a lot of regional headquarters, I, you know, executives here. In fact, I see my good friend O.H. Kwan, who is running Asia for Qualcomm. So that's a, a great example right there. So let's get started with this panel discussion. Uh, you know, we have uh, you know, the four heads of MST, Applied Materials. We have our good friend from, from Kupang joining us. And uh, from, from Mr. Mosti, uh, Mr. Jung, Jung Young joining us. So it might be great if uh, you guys can do a very quick self-introduction and then I can start with some questions. Why don't we start with you, Mark, on the left. Uh, my name is Mark Lee. Uh, I am the president for Applied Materials Korea and the general manager. Nice to meet you. So, Anyang Haseo, good morning. My name is Kevin Peters. I'm the managing director of MSD Korea, which is a subsidiary of Merck and Coing biopharmaceutical company in, in the US. Thank you. 네, 안녕하십니까. 산업통상자원부 투자정책관입니다. 어, 산업통상자원부 투자정책국에서는 외국인 투자 유치, 해외 투자, 유턴 정책을 어, 담당하고 있습니다. 감사합니다. Thank you. And uh, my name is uh, Yongsang Lee. And I'm from Kupang. I'm the Vice President of uh, Legal Affairs at Kupang. I joined Kupang just last year. And before that, I was an attorney and a prosecutor uh, for about 15 years. Uh, thank you for inviting me, and nice to meet you all. 
Great. Welcome, everybody. Why don't we just quickly get started with, uh, with a question from Mr. Jung. You know, despite the pandemic, uh, I think that Korea has, uh, has had record high exports and trade value of $1.26 trillion. Uh, it's a pretty amazing uh, you know, accomplishment. So let me ask Mr. Jung, uh, what do you think are the main drivers for Korea's stellar performance uh, last year? And do you think it's going to continue? Uh, and what are some of the major headwinds you see for Korea? 그 말씀하신 것처럼 지난해 295.5억 불로 사상 최대 외국인 투자 유치를 했습니다. 어, 올해도 역시 어, 어, 어제 날짜로 18% 이상 그 전년 대비 증가한 등 아주 좋은 호조세를 보이고 있습니다. 한국에 대한 그 외국인 투자가들의 그 선호는 첫 번째로 그 한국의 그 안정적인 성장이라고 볼 수가 있습니다. 코비드 19 이후에 어전 세계적으로 경기 침체가 있었는데 그 중에서도 한국이 어 가장 빠른 성 회복세를 보여주 있고 어 지난해 4% 성장 그다음에 올해는 어 러시아 우크라이나 사태 때문에 어 일부 그어 하락이 예상되지만 2% 중반대에 아주 견조한 성장세를 보일 것으로 예상됩니다. 또 하나는 어 아까 그 키노트 스피치나 축사 때도 말씀을 해주셨지만 여러분들이 한국의 그 역동적인 시장 그리고 어 넓은 그 FTA 그 체결 국가를 통해서 한국에 투자하면 외국으로 수출을 할수 있다는 자유롭게 수출할 수 이런 것도 굉장히 장점이고 또 하나는 반도체 디스플레이 배터리 등 한국의 성장하는 첨단 산업의 어 첨단 산업이 존재하기 때문에 이런 기업들에 대해서 어, 납품하기 위해서 어, 제, 어, 소재 부품 업체들이 많이 투자를 하고 있습니다. 어, 그리고 또 하나는 그 한국에서 그 한국 정부가 정책적으로 여기 투자 유출을 해서 어, 굉장히 우수한 인센티브 제도를 어, 제공을 하고 있고요. 이것은 한국이 어, 제조업이 GDP 대비 전 세계적으로 가장 높은 국가 중에 하나이면서도 어, 어, 미국, 일본 다른 국가에 비해서 어, 빠지지 않는 아주 좋은 인센티브 제도도 한몫하고 있다고 생각합니다. And my next question is for Mark. Uh, you know, AIMCHAM had this uh, business survey, and 40% of the respondents reported a negative business comp uh, impact from COVID-19, especially with supply chain as the biggest challenge. So at Applied Materials, how did COVID-19 transform your business? And do you agree with our survey results? Yes, yeah, so the survey results, um, you know, 40% overall, uh, I am not familiar, but I would say definitely 100% of the uh, impact was felt in the semiconductor side due to uh, supply chain shortages. Uh, you know, it really came down to just pure uh, supply and demand, where demand was so strong uh, from our customer, customers, customers, uh, end users. Uh, it was magnified by a supply chain that went all the way down to a, a 10 cent part, impacting a $10 million system and impacting an entire uh, production line. Um, so the business processes, uh, we definitely had to uh, modify and change. We had to really look at the infrastructure. Uh, we had to make investments into our manufacturing. We had to make investments into our supply chain. Uh, we had to look at inventory uh, as, a, as a big factor. Um, and then also we had to look at technology to be able to offset a lot of the, um, the gaps that we saw. Um, so qualifying second or third tier suppliers to increase the supply chain. Um, and then the other thing that we saw is, um, and this is one, I guess, positive thing that we have to look at is it actually increased the capability of our local team. And I think that is something that, you know, we, we looked at, uh, we had to do um, in terms of being um, self-sufficient uh, in Korea. Um, and so you always want to turn something bad into something good something negative into an opportunity. And so I think we've made you know, tremendous uh, gains in terms of um, relationships with our suppliers as well as our customers. And uh, just collectively, we're looking at the forecasting um, and a long-term forecast so that we're not just looking at six months, but we're looking you know, two and three years to be able to give that visibility to the supply chain. Now, my next question is for uh, Mr. Lee from Coupon. You know, Coupon uh, went through a, what I call a major transformation last year, especially with the IPO. And I think it was a highly successful IPO, you know, when it happened. 
So what is your take on Coupang's experience in navigating COVID? Because I think some people can say, well, this must have been very helpful for, for, for your business. But at the same time, because of COVID, you couldn't get people or enough people to work uh, you know, with the system. Yeah, we do have, uh, like you point out, uh, more than 60,000 people working across the country. And we have hundreds of uh, facilities, the logistics facilities. So the last year and the year before that, it has been a very difficult time for us. But uh, our priority, number one priority has always been, and it remains the safety and health of our employees and the customers. And we've, uh, I think, spent significant resources to that end. Uh, in terms of numbers, hundreds of millions in US dollars. And I think we've been successful uh, in achieving that goal as evidenced by our strong growth again last year. So we've been able to uh, uh, keep that priority and still service the increased demands by the customers. But one thing that we are most proud of is that uh, there's a, uh, I think I saw a recent figure uh, that uh, pointed out that the SMEs overall, that whole group in Korea, last year recorded a uh, minus growth of 1.7%. Eight out of uh, 10 sellers on Coupang are SMEs. And we run a special support program for SMEs uh, in collaboration with municipalities. And the companies that participated in those support programs, they recorded last year 69% uh, growth year over year. So that's the fact that uh, we are most proud of. And I think that you know, people should know that although Coupon was homegrown in Korea, you know, it's a, it's a NASDAQ listed you know, US company. And uh, I'm glad that many of us uh, use the Coupon service like I do. Now, let me ask you a question on the, the regulatory environment in Korea. According to the latest OECD report uh, last year, Korea was ranked 35 out of 38 countries in terms of regulatory barriers. And in our survey, Korea unique standards, uh, the CEO risk, and rigid labor laws were a big source of concern. So Kevin, uh, during the pandemic, we all witnessed how innovative vaccines and treatments can affect our lives uh, in a very critical way. And I know that President-elect Yoon also mentioned uh, bio pharmaceutical and biotech industry as one of its key you know, pillars. So as an industry leader, what's your view on the current career regulatory environment? No, thanks, Jim. And um, it was great to see President-elect Yoon talk about the biopharmaceutical industry as a great opportunity. Uh, I fully agree. And I think the fact that we are coming to a different phase of the pandemic is really down to the level of collaboration between the industry, government, science, a lot of which is taking place here in Korea. Maybe I'll take a little step back. You know, Jim, I've been in, in Korea for less than 16, 17 months. I'm still a guest. I'm still new. I'm still learning. Um, but I love this place. And, and Korea is such a great place to do business. So I come from an angle of how can we make it more effective? How can we be supportive to make this a, an even more effective way to do business? Um, and it's no surprise that Senator Orsoff was talking about the number of visas that is opening up for, for Koreans because the quality of, of our people here is just astonishing and the professionalism. But it's true, it's like everywhere, regulation is always gonna be challenging and it's getting this balance between regulation that keeps our employees, our people, our citizens safe at the same time as enabling um, business. And we certainly see some restrictions. Um, I won't talk about SAPA, but I, I don't particularly want to go to prison. Um, <laughs> there's a whole series of, of regulations. We talk about labor um, rigidity and so forth. Um, let me talk a little bit about the biopharmaceutical industry. Um, as I say, this is about creating the room for innovation and creating the ecosystem for innovation. And I think some of the things that we can support, um, and it is good to see that President-elect Yoon is putting together a, a task force reporting directly into the Prime Minister to think about how, how to do this, how to accelerate regulatory processes. Um, this is good for two reasons. It's good for business practice, but in the biopharmaceutical industry, it's also good about bringing medicines and vaccines which will help save 
and improve lives. Um, we have some of the best science taking place in Korea. It's one of our clinical trial hubs is, is Korea. But we find that getting approval and then getting full reimbursement can take many, many, many months. In fact, it's probably one of the slowest periods of reimbursement uh, we, we, we've seen. It takes about 36 months on average to get a cancer drug approved. Now, a lot of that is driven by this regulatory issue that you're talking about. So how do we build better collaboration? How do we simplify the process? How do we move from a transactional engagement with government to a more collaborational engagement I think is going to be so important. I'm optimistic. I think there's a lot of right noises coming out of the, the, the transition committees and so forth. Uh, and therefore, I think it's our responsibility to step up and offer some suggestions. Great. Th thank you very much. Uh, let me go back to uh, Coupon. So again, I talked about how Coupon went public uh, on the New York Stock Exchange uh, uh, last year. What are some of the takeaways from the IPO and uh, and some helpful suggestions for the next administration as U.S. companies uh, do more business here in, uh, in Korea? Uh, I don't know whether this is going to work uh, as a suggestion, but uh, the IPO of Coupon last year was the biggest uh, since Uber uh, in New York Stock Exchange. And then uh, among the foreign companies who listed in uh, New York Stock Exchange, it was the biggest since Alibaba in 2014. And uh, on a, one analyst in Korea called that a uh, game-changing moment for all Korean startups. It's going to open opportunities for global funding and the global IPOs for other startups that are spring up, uh, springing up in Korea. And that's something that, uh, uh, that's most meaningful there. And we drew, I think, one, more than 1.3 trillion Korean won uh, from U.S as foreign investment uh, last year alone. And if you look at where we are spending that money, first we are hiring. So we are now the number three employer in Korea. Secondly, we are reinvesting that money into building logistics infrastructure in Korea. We have built more than 100 uh, facilities across country, and we have already committed more than 1.8 trillion Korean won more to building additional fulfillment centers around the country. And then I mentioned the uh, shared growth with SME. So you can see this uh, virtuous cycle that uh, we have created and effectuated, starting with foreign investment and reinvestment and hiring in Korea, leading to shared growth with SMEs. So I think that's a great model for US-Korea relationship that, that uh, this next administration can take a look at. And I think the next administration should try to find other start startups that can replicate the success and model uh, for the benefit of our economy and as well as uh, a relationship between U.S. and Korea. Great, thank you. Let me go back to you, Mark. My understanding is that uh, Applied Materials is going to open an R&D uh, lab, uh, which I think is tremendous news for, for Korea. What are some hurdles you experienced and highlight some, again, some suggestions for the new administration. Yes, uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, so yes, we are uh, building uh, R&D facility uh, here in Korea. It's the first uh, in the world. Um, you know, I, I just think that as companies scale, and definitely in our industry, as you scale, you have to build up the capability in the country, and you have to be autonomous. You have to be able to make decision-making power I think this is a, a real perfect opportunity for us to you know, build something in the Korea infrastructure that is not just manufacturing, but looking five, 10 years down the road. And what this also does is it brings up the capability of the talent, of the technical ca capability here in Korea, uh, which is also something that we're striving for. And you know, like we mentioned, if we want um, our leaders to be um, you know, APEC leaders or global leaders, you know, we need to bring that capability uh, here to Korea as well. You know, I, I actually, you know, personally, I, I don't look at competition um, between like me and a competitor here in Korea. I don't think in the semiconductor side, competition is between Samsung and SK Hynix, but it's actually competition between Korea versus Singapore, Korea versus Taiwan, Korea versus Japan, and so on. And how we attract more 
companies into Korea is very important. And so I think, Kevin, you mentioned, but, you know, you know, for the new administration, I think, you know, just being, you know, having friendlier terms, um, you know, tax incentives or approval processes that can be much quicker and easier, um, or even a suggestion of having an industrial park or location where foreign companies can come and build, um, you know, an attractive location, I think real, will be really key um, to really help um, the Korea investments and Korea economy going forward. And if we take a look at the theme of uh, the various speakers, not just at this panel, but from uh, earlier this morning, it's about helping make Korea a regional headquarters of Asia. In fact, that's one of AmCham's uh, you know, main priorities because it creates more jobs, creates more you know, opportunities to control the investment side of it. And when you look at our survey, which I hope a lot of you had a chance to look at, uh, Korea was the second most attractive destination to be a regional headquarter next to Singapore, right? And that's pretty significant. So let me ask uh, Kevin and Mr. Lee the question, which is what, what regulatory reforms should the next government uh, prioritize to make Korea the number one regional headquarters? So I think Mark's actually touching a, 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 a lot on this. It reminds me of a story when, when I was building, the re when we were working together to build the regional headquarters in uh, Europe, we were talking to many cantons in Switzerland and they were all bidding for the business. And they were all saying, come for me, we'll give you a 2% or a 1% tax break and we'll give you this and extra. And I remember the, my CEO at the time from the US coming over and saying, you know what's really important, Jim? He said, Will you have the right schools for my people? Will you have the right housing for my people? Will my people feel safe? Will they feel welcomed? And, and I think that's an important measure as well that we should look at. And that's one of the beauties of Korea is that the infrastructure is amazing. The quality of life is outstanding. Uh, and I think that's a really important thing. That, and it's no surprise that therefore Korea is moving up the rankings of attractiveness. It's a truism as well that usually finance makes a lot of these decisions. So freedom of capital is important. Freedom of, fle of labor uh, flexibility is important. But as, as Mark was saying, I also think the regulatory piece is how do we make decisions faster? How do we make it more easy? How do we make those decisions more transparent? And if I have one piece of advice, um, it would be how to be bold. You know, when we talk about regulatory reform, we're not talking about incrementals. We're talking about making bold decisions that fundamentally change the, the course and bend the needle. So I, I think, again, there's a lot of things that can be done around some of the financial aspects, but we're building off a very strong base of, of a very strong infrastructure. That would be my thoughts. What about you, Mr. Lee? Obviously, at Coupon, you don't have any regulatory concerns, right? <laughs> So now is a good time, actually, to yeah. speak up and, uh, you know, and a great opportunity for us to kind of speak to the new administration, because I think they're really willing and able to listen. Yeah. So uh, I would like to point back to the back to our IPO experience first. And uh, uh, there was a, I think, one Wall Street Journal article around that time of our IPO that pointed out that the Korea is becoming the hotbed of startups. And these startups, uh, for the first time in a long, long time, are starting to change the paradigm of the industries and economies. Uh, so I think Kevin mentioned this uh, before, there are really no boundaries of competition for these tech startups and the tech businesses overall, and expanding to, like we can generalize that uh, to all of our businesses here. Uh, so I think what's important is that the next administration should first look at, I hope, some of the peculiar and unique regulations that we have in Korea and start from there. Because I think the startups, uh, they have to be able to try, test, and develop business models, new business models in Korea, and be able to take that to global stage seamlessly. For that to happen, the global standards has to rule uh, in most parts. So taking a look at these unique regulations uh, that we find here are, should be the first 
priority. And in terms of uh, uh, some specifics, uh, I'm obviously from the government side, uh, worked as a government officer for a long time. So looking at that side, I think uh, past administrations have all tried to set up this uh, a mechanism or the structure where uh, the government and businesses collaborate to push through uh, the regulatory reforms or innovations. But their impact, I think, has been curtailed or limited because of uh, several things, a couple of things. First of all, uh, this new structure, this new administration, I think Mr. Yoon has also mentioned that structure where the businesses and the government collaborate to push through regulatory reforms. Uh, but that entity, uh, the collaboration between government and businesses should have stronger enforceability uh, to move the agenda. And if it's still a government lead and business support type of setup. I think uh, it may turn out that we again go with a list of small tasks or small reforms uh, that are easy to achieve, but yet uh, leave open, uh, still uh, leave out very important regulatory reform, uh, the tasks or projects or goals that we need to seek. So that's one. Secondly, from the business side, I think that we have to be more diligent in taking uh, the initiative in this setup uh, by finding and providing hard and concrete data that really shows the people, the general public, and the interested, uh, interested stakeholders that the regulatory innovations and reforms could lead to more benefits for all. So not just demanding deregulation, uh, in generalities, but coming up with hard data and facts, they can persuade the stakeholders and the general public to uh, enforce or uh, push through, push through uh, and uh, uh, materializing uh, some of the important reform projects. I think that's my view here. And from my earlier conversation with uh, Stephen Dunbar Johnson from uh, New York Times, you know, what do you say? Two things, right? One is help make uh, banking a lot easier for foreigners. And second was taxation. So I hope that the Korean government does listen to some of those uh, perspectives. Now, let me go to uh, Mr. Jung. You heard a lot from the audience uh, or the panel today. What is the likely policy direction for the new Korean government on positioning Korea as a great place for FDI into Korea? Uh, 한국은 뭐 앞서 그 발표자께서 말씀드렸지만 전 세계적으로 가장 매력적인 투자처 중에 하나입니다. 그리고 한국 정부는 이러한 그 외국인 기업뿐만 아니라 국내 기업에 대한 투자 환경도 세계 최고 수준으로 유지하려고 하고 있습니다. 어, 그 제임스 김 회장님께서 어, 규제 완화 쪽에 굉장히 관심이 많으시고 어, 저희 쪽에도 여러 번 말씀하셨는데 규제 완화는 어, 굉장히 중요한 부분 중에 하나입니다. 어, 특히 어, 규제를 어, 합리화하고 그다음에 투명하고 이렇게 집행하는 것들이 기업의 무엇보다 중요하다는 걸 저희는 잘 알고 있습니다. 어, 특히 그, 그래서 저희는 그 암찬뿐만 아니라 EUCCK, 서울 재팬클럽, 어, 그다음에 중국 상공회에서 어, 한국에 있는 모든 외국인 투자 기업들, 그다음에 투자 기업들을 대표하는 상공회에서와 함께 지속적으로 어, 대화를 하고 있고 서울 재팬클럽과 EUCCK는 저희한테 매년 백서를 제출하고 있습니다. 그래서 어, 외국 투자 기업들이 어, 불만스러운 어, 규제 내용들을 백서에 담아 저희가 제출하면 저희가 그러, 그 규제 내용들을 관계부처와 협의해서 어, 일일이 다 대답을 해주고 있습니다. 이 정도로 한국 정부에서 규제 개선을 위한 어, 투명, 어, 투명하고 어, 그 합리적으로 절차를 운영하려고 하고 있고 한국 정부의 반응성 또한 굉장히 어, 우수하다고 볼수 있습니다. 아마 기업하시는 여러분들께서 해외에 나가서 어, 기업 활동을 했을 때 외국 정부와 어, 행정 절차나 행정 처, 처리를 할때 느끼는 속도와 강도 그리고 한국에서 비즈니스 살때 비교해 보면 한국이 얼마나 정보가 투명하고 객관적으로 그리고 반응성 있게 어, 행정을 처리하는지 알수 있을 겁니다. 하지만 여전히 많은 기업들이 어, 투자 환경 개선을 요청하고 있습니다. 이건 비단 
외국인 투자 기업뿐만 아니라 국내 기업들도 마찬가지입니다. 그래서 어, 지금 산업통상자부에서 적극적으로 이 어, 새 정부의 규제 개선과 합리화를 위해서 적극 노력을 하려고 하고 있고 어, 인수위와도 충분히 협의를 하고 있습니다. 아마 공식적으로 발표는 아직 안 났는데 저희가 새 정부가 출범하면 어, 굉장히 어, 기존에 있는 규제조차도 특히 많은 분들이 어, 제조업 부분에서는 어, 그렇게 많은 규제를 제기를 하지 않고 있지만 금융을 비롯한 서비스, 그다음에 노동, 지배구조 부분에서 일부 어, 규제 완화를 어, 요청을 하고 있는 기업가들이 좀 있습니다. 그래서 저희들이 이런 기업들이 국내 기업뿐만 아니라 여기 투자 기업들이 어떻게 어, 불, 어, 불필요하거나 불합리한 규제 개선을 요청을 하고 이제 이걸 정부가 받아서 어떻게 국가적 차원에서 해결을 할지 필요하면 관계 법령을 어, 개정이나 제정을 하려고 하고 있고 이러한 노력들은 아마 어, 인수위가 어, 종료된 시점에 국정과제가 발표될 겁니다. 그 안에 어, 어, 규제 개선을 위한 한국 정부의 의지와 어, 방향이 담겨 있을 겁니다. 어, 제가 그걸 여기서 발표할 어, 그런 자격은 없기 때문에 그 정도 수준을 말씀드리고 어, 제가 분명히 약속드릴 수 있는 건 어, 한국 정부가 전 세계적으로 85% 경제 규모에 해당하는 국가들과 FTA를 체결했습니다. 그 과정에서 외국인 기업의 차별적인 제도는 거의 없어졌습니다. 여기 지금 쿠팡에서 나와 있지만 쿠팡이 한국에 지금까지 투자한 기업 중에 가장 큰 기업입니다. 몇년 전까지만 해도 GM이었는데 그 바뀌었습니다. 오늘 아침에 통계자를 보니까 한국에 가장 많이 투자한 5위 기업 중에 두개 기업이 플랫폼 비즈니스입니다. 여기 나와 있는 쿠팡과 딜리버리 히어로가 투자한 우한 형제들이죠. 어, 한국이 규제가 신산업 분야에서 규제가 많았다면 어떻게 이렇게 어, 한 5위 이내에 되는 가장 많은 투자를 한 기업들이 신산업 분야 플랫폼 비즈니스의 외국 투자 기업일 수 있겠습니까? 어, 그럴 정도로 한국 어, 규제는 투명하지만 앞으로도 어, 혁신 성장을 위해서 한국 정부가 지속적으로 규제 완화와 개선을 할 의지와 준비가 되어 있다는 것은 제가 말씀드릴 수 있습니다. So I have a follow-up question for you. Uh, do you see some big differences between the previous administration and the new administration as far as policies going forward? And if so, what do you think they will be? 어, 굉장히 곤란한 질문을 저한테 하셨는데. <웃음> That's my job as the moderator. <웃음> 어, 이전 정부와 앞으로 올 정부의 이 규제 개선에 있어서 어, 방향은 어, 크게 다르지 않다고 봅니다. 다만 속도와 내용 면에서 일부 차이는 있을 수 있지만 규제 개선을 하고 한국을 전 세계에서 가장 기업하기 좋은 국가로 만들기 위한 그런 방향성은 동일하다고 볼수 있습니다. Thank you very much. I apologize for putting in that position, but AMCHAM is also a non-political. Non-partisan organization. So we are willing, ready, and able to work with any administration to help make Korea a great business destination. So, in the balance of the time we have, uh, let's just have a frank discussion on what do you think are the keys to success here in Korea? Okay, and let's start with you at Coupon. You know, obviously, Coupon is a is a considered a huge success. Uh, So, what do you think are the keys to business success here? Can I go last? Because uh, okay, <laughs> fine. I'm a, I'm a uh, like I worked uh, mostly as a uh, uh, public officer, and I'm trying mm -hmm. to masquerade as, as a businessman. But okay, given the opportunity, uh, I'll say what I saw as a government officer and what I see now in the private sector. I think the uh, the important key I would say is speed. And the adaptability to change. Uh, I say this because uh, Korean consumers. We face a lot of consumers at Coupang. Uh, they are, as they are known very well, very technologically savvy, and uh, they are early adopters, and they are not uh, afraid to change. And if you look at the policy side, not the consumer side, but the policy side, you hear complaints that the policies change too often and too much. But on the flip side. The positive thing is that the government is not afraid to take on new challenges and make changes to address the business environment. And just one anecdotal uh, 
anecdote that I can share with you from my experience is that I worked at the Ministry of Justice working on the international treaties with a lot of uh, uh, countries. We've built, I think, uh, I think we, were, we have been the fastest in country in building that international network of criminal uh, cooperation. And I think that's just representative or indicative of our, how our government works. We want to be part of the global uh, community, and we want to be uh, uh, adaptable to global standards, and we move fast. And for businesses to succeed in Korea, I think also the key is moving with a lot of speed and being able to change and adapt to new policies and the new environments and the demands from the consumers and et cetera. Yeah. And I think moving with speed is uh, what you guys do, right? The rocket delivery, which is, uh, which is amazing. So keep up the great work. Uh, so Mark, you've been in Korea now for off and on, uh, what, several years, right? You're running a huge business called Applied Materials. You have both SK Hynix and Samsung all over you, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you think are the keys to success for you as the country manager here? Uh, and for applied materials. So I think uh, touched upon a couple of those things in terms of uh, R&D capability and speed, I think are key. Um, I think I, I just wanna also mention, I think we bring uh, as a foreign company, a unique, we're in a unique position to bring global benchmark standards to Korea. So, you know, in addition to, you know, the technology and all the other things that we're working with our customers, with our suppliers, but we need to partner with them on initiatives such as ESG, um, areas you know, such as um, diversity and inclusion, carbon reduction, um, so climate change. I think those are things that we have to partner uh, with our uh, you know, customers and suppliers, and we have to look at this uh, from a big picture point of view. Um, I think the second thing that I would say is the people, because we have to grow the Korean employees to be global leaders. And I think those all stand, you know, do we want to be APAC? We want to be, you know, all these areas that we want to focus on is the people. And so how we do that, you know, how we train them to be, you know, more spoken um, out, how we, you know, give them the, um, you know, the training to be uh, better communicators. Um, all these things, you know, whether we do it in rotations back to headquarters, I think those as leaders, uh, we have to have that responsibility uh, going forward. Um, I think this is just, um, you know, how we strive to do these things um, are very important and how we grow our people in Korea to be global leaders are very important. And whether this is a short-term plan or a long-term plan, but this has to be a part of the playbook that we have in this country. How about you, Kevin? After 18 months in Korea, uh, what do you think? What's key to success, business success in Korea, apart from Amcham membership, of course? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> I think my fellow panelists have been very clear, and, and, and I would echo their comments. I think there's three things. Where we've been most successful is where we've been truly partnering, whether it be with local companies or whether it be with the government. And if I think about our, our antiviral for, for COVID, you know, where we were successful was when we were partnering with KDCA, with MFDS and, and, and the government of bringing it into the country and, and it's now having an impact on, on this pandemic. That is key, that partnership. And I think there's sometimes a skepticism and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, a lack of trust between uh, authorities and, and companies. And I think if we can bring a little bit more trust there um, from both sides, I think that would be important. The second is innovation. This is probably the most innovative country in the world. We've seen it in many different sectors. Um, we see it in the pharmaceutical sector and the science that's taking place here. How do we create that ecosystem for innovation? Um, because that's great for the industry, it's great for all of the people. And the third, I echo um, Mark's comment about that horrible expression, human capital, people. You know, when I walk into my office, I'm surrounded by some of the most professional, dedicated, capable individuals that I have ever worked with in my 25-year career in MSD. And I'm really proud that many of those are now working at region and global. 
And I think, you know, building on that human capital, building on people through ESG, through diversity inclusion, I think is going to be so important. So, um, as I say, 18 months, 18 months in Korea is like five years anywhere else. This is intense, but it is an amazing place, and I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. You know, I know we have uh, just a couple of minutes left, but, you know, I've been in Korea now for, for 18 years, and I would not be here for this long had I not thought that Korea was a great place to work, live. And now my passion is to help, uh, you know, U.S. companies establish Korea as a regional headquarter. And I think that now than, than ever before, it's an exciting time to sell Korea, right? And I think K-Wave 10 years ago was an anomaly, but K-Wave now is real, right? We got K-pop, we got K-drama, we got K films, we got K food all over, and not even K sports. So now Korea is globally recognized. So for those of you in the audience who want to do more in Korea or help us establish Korea's regional headquarters, be very proud of what this opportunity provides for all of us. Okay? And as uh, Kevin mentioned, yeah, I'd like to see everybody become very active with Amchan. So again, thank you so much for listening to the panel. Uh, I want to, in particular, thank uh, you know Mr. Jung for being here representing uh, Moti. I've had many sessions with Mr. Jung, and he is a career government uh, you know expert. So I think all of us we have an opportunity to work very closely with Mr. Jung. So if you have challenges or opportunities, he's the man we can go to. Okay, so again, thank you so much. I think we have break. Uh, hopefully we'll have lunch after that. Uh, so have a great networking session. Thank you. Please give another big round of applause to our participants. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now resume the seminar. We will turn to the first presentation of the day from Director Ku Bon Hee from Investso, who will present on the topic of Introduction to Investso and Investment Environment of Seoul. Please help me welcome the presenter to the stage. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Bon Hee. I'm a director of uh, Investor Seoul. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, tell you the, my organization, uh, actually the Investor Seoul is uh, operated by Seoul Metropolitan Government to induce foreign investment into Seoul area. The presentation uh, consists of two parts. Uh, the first half is uh, uh, telling you the, the readiness and the attractiveness and the good business environment of Seoul and Korea. And the second half is telling you what is the main function of Investor Seoul and uh, how can we help you to invest or the consideration doing a business in Korea and so on. So now uh, let's start the first slide. According to the Bloomberg Innovation Leader, uh, we, uh, Korea is a global innovation leader, you already know but and according to the Bloomberg Innovation Index rankings, we were ranked as uh, number one for eight consecutive years. <coughs> Patent activity was number one, and R&D intensity was number two. Uh, we were ranked uh, good scores in various evaluation, evaluation items. And for the 2021 uh, European Innovation Scoreboard, we were selected as the most innovative country uh, more than uh, any other countries, and are performed 21% uh, above the EU average. When it comes to the how smart Seoul is, we were awarded the City Award at the 2019 Smart City Expo World Congress. So it was highly praised for analyzing urban phenomena and the civic action based on the world best smart city infrastructure. And for the establishing corporate system that solves the city problems with the citizens, for the more Korea stands atop, 
the 2020 UN e-government system and the hold the second rank in the e-government development index. And South Korea is well known for its digitalization. Eight, more than 85% of individuals using a computer and more than 95% of population has a smartphone. This gives them more insight for the investors to consider doing a business in Korea and the South. Also, the talent acquisition is more important than ever before. Actually, Korea is uh, well known for the, uh, the desires for the education. So uh, we have 70% uh, of college graduates between 25 to 34 age group. This figure is more than Canada, Japan, and other countries. If you look at the uh, right side of the, this page, you can see the R&D personal by degree. More than 20% uh, are doctorate degree, and 27% uh, is master's degree holders. For the technical R&D and the other sports, Seoul provides a support service for technology development, such as new product development and technology upgrade research. So for the R&D, 300 SMEs, SME is a set for the small and medium-sized entrepreneurs, enterprises, were selected and 40 million US dollars of R&D grant war. Thank you. Uh, awarded annually. 4,000 SMEs are getting IP protection and the consulting and the registration annually. Uh, you can see the uh, screen. Uh, there's a, uh, the unicorn list. So 10 unicorns are located in Seoul among 12 unicorns of Korea. And uh, with that in mind, uh, we try to explore the opportunities and uh, have uh, various sport programs such as a demo day, matching and uh, accelerating programs, and many more for foreign investors to induce the investment. Seoul is a very densely populated city. Therefore, 90% of companies are service-based. As it was mentioned, the, the seven industry business clusters are located inside of the Seoul. The from Y Valley, that is famous for the IoT and the drone cluster. And the Yeido map is famous for the uh, finance sector. So you can see the uh, seven different uh, business clusters, which was specialized and distinguished and categorized by the industry. So it is evident that, that the foreign uh, invested business have a positive impact on our local economy. So Seoul Metropolitan Government provides the various benefits and the incentives, including cash grants and the tax exemption. Especially Seoul is the only local government that offers the employment of society education and the training subsidies in consideration of the employment scale and the impact on the development of the local economy. So once uh, the single, uh, single employee hired, we can grant uh, the total of 800 US dollars per month up to six months. So now, this is the second part, and then now I am telling you the, about the Investor Seoul. This is the organization newly launched this February, and the Seoul Metropolitan Government wants to induce more foreign investors and doing a, a more business from foreign uh, companies into Korea and into Seoul. Uh, this slide shows the uh, three main functions, core service of the investor soul. 
actually the uh, it provide this uh, our organization provide uh, more information on the investment environment in Seoul and connect the Seoul startups with global investors and to provide the investment settlement and the follow up management. First of all, uh, investor Seoul provides uh, information on the global global investor interest such as source of economic and uh, industrial policies to investors and the companies who are considering investing in Seoul. In addition, uh, through the website, uh, actually the website is now in construction and uh, already there is, but uh, we have uh, more insights and the knowledge will be put into the, our website. And uh, we, pro we will provide AI chatbot platform uh, for the consultation Actually, AI chip, by using AI chatbot, uh, we can lift the bus of uh, time and uh, space restrictions. So you can use uh, the AI chatbot and with freely, uh, I think it leaves the uh, next month, I think. So for the... Uh, Promising companies in Seoul, uh, we, we will keep the investment environment of Seoul and helps excellent companies in Seoul to attract investment. From the basic and the advanced and to the premium programs, we will support more and more for the companies uh, which were trying to uh, scale up their size and their revenues and their profits. And for the foreign investors, we operate uh, spot programs for potential foreign investors who are interested in Seoul. When foreign investors and companies visit Seoul, we uh, provide information on the Seoul industrial ecosystem and the spot online and offline matching with the interested Seoul companies. This program, this program includes to source uh, major industrial sectors and the clusters and the meetings with the uh, domestic entrepreneurs, uh, domestic uh, investors, and the industry specialists. And also we have an uh, all-in-one program package, which can be a more practical support for the uh, foreign invested investors service expense for the incorporation and the capital increase, or the consulting on labor or other tax issues. We can support uh, related expenses to the foreign uh, investors. And also we, are you, uh, we keep, the, uh, we keep the, uh, the service for the aftercare service. It is uh, once the, uh, the foreign invested company was operated and uh, doing a business in Korea, in Seoul, we will match uh, business partners for each uh, interest. If you have any need for the management of uh, uh, some area, we will arrange the uh, meetings one by one or the online or the offline seminars or the forums. So those are various uh, methods that will be helpful for uh, operating as, and the, or the managing the, their business. So this is the, uh, the end of the, my presentation. If you or actually the, already you uh, reside in Korea and uh, if your mother company or the, your friend or even your business competitor or your enemy have some interest to invest in Seoul, please let me know. Please contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ku, for your presentation. I would like to turn it over to Ms. Moon Joo Yoon, Director of GR Korea. She will be presenting on the topic of government relations, work with strategy, not perception. Please give her a big round of applause.
already. Um, good morning, everybody. I am Ji Yun Moon, and I am director at GR Korea. Um, it is a great pleasure to speak today at a very important momentum in business and also in politics. With the recent presidential election and upcoming government transition, I think it's a critical time for many business leaders who want to think one step ahead and plan their government relations strategy. I would like to thank AmCham and also, of course, Chairman James Kim for inviting Jerry Korea to this amazing and prestigious event. So thank you so much. All right. Um, last year at the same event, I remember covering the definition and value of government relations. Today, I would like to speak more about the importance of approaching government relations with strategy in order to be successful in doing business in Korea. But of course, before we dive in, I would like to quickly recap. So the gist of government relations lies in planning and implementation of proactive engagement with public policy stakeholders. And the purpose of this activity is to create an environment that is conducive to your business. Along with other pillars in the business, government relations is crucially important because it contributes to creating a playground that you will um, do your business. So a successful government relations activity can give you multiple benefits, as you can see here, including shaping positive business environment, better anticipating political challenges and opportunities, and also managing corporate reputation among political stakeholders, and so on. So thankfully, many leading companies already well understand the value of government relations. Many have been already investing a lot of resource in doing their government relations activities around the globe. And of course, a lot of companies are doing exactly the same here in Korea as well. But more than often, many start by thinking about some generally negative perception about Korean government and its regulatory bodies. Well, of course, when you're on the on the record setting, you'll be you know, very political and careful. But when you're at the off the record setting, and when you're just speaking to us in person and very casually, they start by thinking how Korea has been one of the most excessive regulatory regulative business environment in the globe. Another popular topic that people like to start with is to pinpointing how Korean government and its regulatory bodies are quite unlikely to be friendly to foreign companies when they actually when you actually go speak to them. During my continued conversations with foreign companies and business leaders, I realized that such perception might be the one that's holding a lot of foreign companies back from successfully engaging with the Korean government and policy stakeholders. So today, I really want to emphasize that it is not such perception that you should start from when you're planning your government relations activity. The Korean government has continuously and rigorously put its effort to undertake regulatory reforms. Um, the regulatory reforms were all to promote economic growth, whether it's coming from domestic companies or foreign companies. Such effort, of course, was highlighted during the recent presidential election. Um, indeed, you might all remember when then candidate and now president elect Yoon Seok yeol and Lee Jae Myung visited AmCham to listen to your difficulties and your suggestions. The Korean government is also trying very hard to promote Korea as an economic hub of the region, like what AmCham is doing as well. So for instance, free economic zones have been supporting foreign investments and business leaders by providing various tax benefits, infrastructure support, and exemptions on some of the labor regulations. Allow me to uh, be a little more specific about the Korean government's effort to support business through the regulatory reforms. As you can see here, 
for decades, regulatory reform has always been included as a key agenda item for the president. And very thankfully, President-elect Yoon is not going to be an exception. Yoon and his transition committee announced that his administration will create an industry innovation strategy committee. This is to foster innovation while providing remedy for regulatory hurdles for business. Just yesterday as well, Yoon again mentioned that he will fix all unnecessary regulations to help the business, whether it's domestic business or foreign business. The fact that this kind of new committee concentrating on deregulation will be under the office of the president also implies that the president-elect has a big willingness to move forward with the deregulation. So I would really like to recommend that you pay good attention to such initiatives to understand your chances and also opportunities. Pay attention to this kind of initiatives rather than the general perception that might actually hold you back. So here might be the more interesting part. The thing you should really be focusing more on is building your strategy. While the Korean government might be more willing to listen to your stories, your hardships, and your suggestions, but at the same time, you have to make sure that it is easy on their eyes. It is interesting enough for, for the government relations officials as well. Um, as you can see here, the strategy is among the four phases, but it's still a very crucial one. So before you jump on to building the strategy right away, start with a clean slate, not with, pre not with your prejudice, not with your perception, but acute analysis of your business environment, your regulatory landscape, and also recent political discussions. And carefully conduct research around what seems to be the most relevant political discussion to your business. People conduct stakeholders and issue mapping all the time. It's a regular activity for a lot of business. But really, Please question yourself, how many of those stakeholders on your report do you really think are or could be an active influencers to your cause when it comes to policy discussions? Think about the relationships and dynamics between the stakeholders as if you were to go on a conversation with them tomorrow. Then you'll be able to refine your stakeholders mapping in a much helpful way. Korea is a politically dynamic environment. It's dynamic not only in the political sphere, of course, but in general. And in this environment, it is important to have a good compass that will help you find a way. And the strategy part is going to serve as your compass when navigating Korean government relations activities. The most important thing in strategy building in government relations is to, setting, is to set a concrete but achievable goals. What I'm really constantly surprised about is that a lot of companies are really capable of building amazing sales or, or marketing strategies, but they just don't do the same nor put the same effort to their government relations strategy. Start thinking about your company's relationship with the government in short, mid, and longer term. Try to put as much effort as you can as if you were building other strategies for your different pillars in your business. And also make sure that you create building blocks that will gradually lead you to your goal. Starting from building awareness, building your new relationships, to creating a coalition partner and participating in specific policy discussions. Make sure that you also have an actionable items and plan them carefully around 
political schedules and political milestones. There could be election, there could be public confirmation hearings, national assembly audit, or even budget cycle. You will be able to develop much better narrative if you think of your narrative in the government, government officials' shoes. You have to understand what are the key issues that the government officials would be interested at the moment and try to couple with those milestones with your narrative. Your actions, of course, need to be in line with the building blocks that you designed earlier, of course. And your actions and communication with the government should be a set of program under the overarching strategy that you have, rather than many different individual actions or reactions. This is a serious, committed relationship you have with the government. Um, the government, of course, is consisted of many different people, but you have to think of the government as one person that you have a serious relationship with. So your actions you believe are independent will have a synergy effect and impact your business somehow. If that's the case, those actions should be strategically designed and implemented so that you can understand their impact and anticipate what's, what are those actions gonna do to your business. So this thought process here will help you navigate the environment with more confidence, but less fear, and also help you walk away from the general perception that you might have. Do not let your perceptions hold back from your activities and talking to the government, because the government, as we've seen today, is willing to talk to business and also to help you succeed here in Korea. So work with strategy, because the government is ready to help and communicate with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moon, for your presentation. Now we will welcome Mr. Baek Young Jae, Managing Director of Philip Morris Korea for the next presentation. He'll be presenting on the topic of delivering a better future with the right transformation. Please give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Uh, I'm YJ Pak. Uh, Managing Director of Philip Morris Korea. And before I start my presentation, I will start with a very short video. Some men see things as they are and say why. I dream things that never were and say why not. Extraordinary, you must do extraordinary. Shokshina, 이제는 담배 역시 혁신의 대상이 되어야 합니다. 땡큐. you. These days uh, technology is turning the world into a more comfortable world and new technologies are improving people's lives such as food transformation, healthcare, and beyond. And these technologies uh, can effectively address many of the grand challenges of the 21st century. And the challenge related to smoking cigarettes uh, is no exception. And there's no doubt that the best way to reduce the risks of smoking is to stop smoking. However, the reality is the most smokers simply do not quit. And the World Health Organization forecasts that there will be uh, more than uh, 1 billion smokers by the year 2025. So we, as a tobacco company, uh, is fully committed to resolve this grand challenge by building the future of, on the smoke-free products 
and using the technology and science we have. And we made a dramatic decision to move forward uh, its vision to a smoke-free future, uh, to provide better alternatives to the consumers. So before we introduce uh, how we are going to change the world, uh, let me brief briefly explain who we are. The Filmers Korea was established in 1989. Since the establishment, we have in, uh, in endeavored to provide high quality tobacco products to the adults uh, in Korea. And we have grown into a fairly large company uh, with 1,000 employees in Korea and the annual turnover of 600 billion uh, Korean won. What has uh, largely changed over the past years is our vision uh, and view on the tobacco products. In 2017, Filmworks Korea announced its vision to deliver a smoke-free future uh, in Korea to replace combustible products, mainly cigarettes, by smoke-free products. Since then, we have been disrupting our business by providing less harmful alternatives uh, for other smokers who do not quit. The Yangsan factory, our first and only smoke-free product uh, manufacturing facility in APEC area, exemplifies our commitment to the vision by supplying less harmful products uh, for, bo for both domestic and abroad. Since then, we are undergoing a massive transformation, both internally and externally, to achieve our smoke-free future vision. Our transformation has uh, begun uh, from asking ourselves questions. What are we inventing? And how does our invention affect individual smokers uh, who don't quit? With a global investment of more than 9 billion US dollars over and over 1,300 patents on the technology, we have developed a smoke-free product called IQOS that has an average of 95% less harmful chemicals and potentially uh, uh, which is in the regular uh, cigarettes. Of course, uh, it didn't happen overnight. It was more than 30 years of journey uh, of, uh, after undergoing numerous trials and errors. And years before, uh, we were just a company selling cigarettes, Marlboro, Parliament, you name it. Now, we are more than just a cigarette selling company. We are transforming into a tech and healthcare company that is able to provide better alternatives for smokers who don't quit smoking cigarettes. Millions of men and women worldwide have already switched to our product uh, and given up smoke, uh, smoking cigarettes completely. And this is just the beginning, and smoke-free future is within our grasp. The scientific studies have shown that the switching completely uh, from conventional cigarettes to our smoke-free products reduces human body's exposure to harmful and potentially harmful chemicals. The US FDA, one of the strictest agency uh, in the world when it comes to the health matters, uh, concluded that the available scientific evidence demonstrates that our innovative products like ICOS is expected to benefit the health of the po population as a whole. The agency authorized uh, the marketing of ICOS as a modified risk tobacco products. And in doing so, the agency confirmed that an ICOS exposure modifications uh, order is appropriate to promote the public health. Let me explain more details about this uh, in the later slides. Our vision cannot be achieved without our serious commitment and willingness to change. We have shown these commitments and willingness to change through investment and numerous scientific researches, as, as I mentioned. We are further committed to our vision and ready to bring positive impacts to Korean smokers and larger public health and by uh, establishing R&D center in Korea. Korea's position as a, one of the world's most innovative nation is our greatest opportunity to advance our science and technology. According to the recent data, uh, Korea ranked second uh, among the OECD countries in R&D uh, spending in proportion of the GDP. And this indicates that there is no reason for us to hesitate to establish R&D center in Korea. These days, we are seriously discussing with the HQ 
on our plan to establish R&D center in Korea, as we strongly believe that it would accelerate our vision. But it takes more than manufacturers' effort to achieve this uh, smoke-free future. The government has its role to play by legis uh, legislating regulations that set science-based product standards and regulatory policies that enable less harmful products to replace cigarettes. To be clear, regulations should continue to dissuade people from starting to smoke and encourage cessation. It is equally clear that millions of men and women will continue to smoke, and they should have the opportunity to switch to better alternatives. Then you may question, what is the science-based policy? The best example I can share is the US FDA's tobacco control policy. Unlike the Korea's, uh, Korean tobacco regulation, which is controlled by different ministries, such as Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Health and Welfare, etc., the US tobacco policy is controlled by a single agency, the uh, US FDA. Since 2009, the US FDA is given the full authority to regulate the manufacture, distribution, and marketing of tobacco products. After extens extensive review and scientific assessment, the agency decided uh, to authorize the selling and marketing of tobacco products only when the products are scientifically demonstrated as appropriate and beneficial for public health. As you can see in the bottom right image, we are able to marketing uh, of our smoke-free products as less exposure of harmful chemicals than cigarettes after the F US FDA's authorization. The FDA's decision to provide an important example of how governments and public health organizations can regulate smoke-free alternatives to differentiate them from cigarettes in order to protect and promote the public health. Our vision is to create a smoke-free future where smokers have a better choice than smoking cigarettes. And we will accelerate such a vision by establishing R&D Center in Korea. And we cannot achieve this uh, smoke-free future vision by ourselves. We as a manufacturer will continue to innovate through the technology and science. At the same time, consumers need to be delivered with accurate information about our science and technology. They have the right to choose better alternatives other than cigarettes. Most importantly, the government needs to have a science-based policy that is based on science and technology and transparency, not based on the ideology uh, or politics. Together, we can make the better future. And I would uh, just want to end the presentation with the three bullet points, uh, which I always say. First, if you didn't start the smoking, please do not start. If you started already, please stop and quit. But if you don't want to stop and quit, then please change to the alternative solutions such as ICOS. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Beck, for your presentation. Now we will welcome Ms. Christina Ahn, Managing Director of Morgan Phillips Korea for the next presentation. She'll be presenting on the topic of the future of work, jobs, and careers, Agenda for Innovation and, and Empowerment. Please give her a big round of applause. Thank you. It's a great honor to be here today. And I'd like to thank not only Mr. James Kim for um, holding this special um, and amazing event, but also every single AmCham staff member who put, who I know put in a lot of work and effort to make this a uh, huge success. Um, so I titled today's presentation on HR issues as the future of work, jobs, and careers. I mean, that's a pretty lofty title that's akin to, you know, squeezing um, the whole history of mankind into maybe 15 minutes of presentation. And I know that you guys are all very um, tired and hungry, so I'll try to make it as quick as possible. Okay, so let me just quickly go through some of the post-pandemic employment uh, market trends. There's been 
the highest, it's been the highest job growth rate in 22 years as of 2021. And this is due to the fact that there was a huge dip in um, gr job growth rates in 2000 and earlier in 2021 due to COVID. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the global talent interest in Korea, just like people like James Kim, you know, John Kim, um, Claudia in the audience, there's a huge diaspora of Korean Americans or Koreans living abroad it, who in the last two and a half years during COVID have expressed interest in moving back to Korea. And I think this is well aligned with James's vision of having Korea as the next Asia hub for talent and also having headquarters based out of Korea. Um, you know, as we, as Korea as a country, as we attract more, not just Korean overseas talent, but global talent in general, I think we'll be able to make this very possible. I mean, I work as an executive recruiter and I would say that on a weekly basis, I have random non-Korean foreigners reaching out to me, telling me that they like to move to Korea and work here. And of course, um, not to mention all the expats and foreigners who are already here who wish not to leave. Okay, and then there's the growing employment gap between large companies and SMEs. Even though the job growth rate has picked up significantly in 2021, and continuing forward into this year, um, small and medium enterprises continue to face huge obstacles in attracting um, good talent. And of course, Korea is, I think, um, the sole government um, presenter presented the statistics earlier. Korea is one of the most well-credentialed societies in the world with the highest number of college graduates. So even though we have, you know, a lot of PhDs and masters and bachelor's degree holders, um, the employment rate of college graduates are actually dropping. So I'll share some information about that later. And again, um, the government just recently re lifted all COVID restrictions minus the masks. So hybrid work is now being seen as a key benefit that we provide to employees. It's not just a, a, a necessity, but now it's seen it's being shifted into um, a benefit category. All right, so against that background, What's the impetus for innovation and empowerment as we look forward? Um, we have the aging workforce. There's a huge generational divide in the workplace. I know AmCham held a very special uh, panel discussion about this earlier in the year. Um, there's not a day that goes by without us reading something about the MZ generation in the news, right? So that's been a huge, um, I guess, accelerator in terms of how we look at work and the organizational cultures that we need to cultivate, cultivate as leaders. Um, because of COVID, we now have a newly defined employment, employer-employee relationship. You know, I'm sure all of you have heard about the, the great resignation in the U.S., I mean, I would say that in Korea, there is no great resignation, but definitely coupled with the whole generation, generational divide, people are looking at this whole relationship from a different perspective. And I think, um, again, as an executive recruiter, talking to a lot of leaders in the multinational sector, this is becoming, I mean, we're starting to see a talent shortage in terms of the types of profiles that they're seeking. Okay. And then there's the rise of the gig economy. Um, you know, there's Korea has such a, 
a dichotomy between waged workers and self-employed, right? But we have these new category of workers called um, platform employees, right? Like the, the food delivery people, the freelancers, right? And these are the people who are kind of redefining what the labor market will look like in the future. So that's another impetus for innovation and empowerment. And lastly, I don't need to elaborate on the ESG agenda and how gender imperative is changing how we work uh, on a daily basis. Right. Okay, so the aging workforce, I'm gonna talk a little bit about each topic. Um, let's see. So between 2011 and 2020, the number of people younger than 25 years old dropped from 15 million to 12 million. Um, the number of Koreans 55 and older has increased from 11 million to 16 million in a little less than a decade, right? Generational divide in the workplace. I mean, we talked about the whole Gonde culture and there's now, it's becoming even more, um, I guess, specific in that there's young Gondes and middle mid-level Gondes and, you know, older Gondes, right? So people my age see our jobs as just one fraction of our life, move more a tool to build our lives. On the contrary, my superiors see their jobs as a critical part of their lives, their identity, right? So this is exacerbating kind of the post-pandemic um, organizational crisis, if you will, that every leader is seeing. I mean, these days, it's difficult to really predict what's going to happen because it's just, we're just starting, all the leader, business leaders are just starting to think about, well, how do we deal with hybrid work? How do we deal with teamwork when everyone is just dispersed? And, you know, can we get back, can we get them back into the office? There was actually a McKinsey study that was published just, I think just last week, just hot off the press, that according to research, they feel that just one or two days in the office is the most optimal number of days that McKinsey recommends, and it kind of hits the sweet spot. But you put that into a Korea context, is it feasible? You know, as far as I know, a lot of the, the Korean large conglomerates who set the tone for labor um, trends are asking everyone to come back to the office. Then that's going to have ramifications in terms of attraction, development, and retention of talent. Okay. All right. And this is closely related to number two, the newly defined employer-employee relationship. Um, you know, the MZ generation already has a very new and different way of looking at work. Um, and I think the rise of fintech, rise of cryptocurrency, and different ways of um, earning income has also shaped the way people look at how what this employment relationship is, okay? This is just a side note, but, you know, um, the whole luxury industry has also moved from, from, you know, offline to online because of COVID. And I was recently talking to this new um, luxury platform leader, and she was telling me that the number one customer base for this new segment of consumers is young men in their late 20s who are buying up luxury goods like crazy on this, this luxury platform. And I wondered why, I asked her why. I mean, we speculated that it's because all these young men who have made a lot of money and fortune off of 
cryptocurrency investments have nowhere to spend the money. So that's, you know, that's what they're doing. Just a side note. Whoops. All right, then that's also related to the rise of the gig economy, the self-employed. You know, in the U.S., when I was living in the U.S., I used to think that being self-employed self equaled being an entrepreneur. But apparently in Korea, there's a big difference, right? Being an entrepreneur is more like you're tech savvy and you're getting funding. Well, self-employed in Korea means you're kind of, you have a chicken, fried chicken shop or a coffee shop. And um, these people are not protected by the law. You know, they have that option to employ people and to get all the, the social um, benefits provided by the government. But because it tends to be expensive, they opt not to do so. So that's also propelling um, this dichotomy, if you will, between self-employed, waged workers and um, this new category of platform workers as well. All right, and ESG gender agenda, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later during the panel discussion, but um, gender, you know, I think in terms of governance, um, you know, Korea likes to talk about diversity and inclusion and the gender agenda, but in actuality, it's actually more about just inclusion, right? Respecting people's differences. And um, I think Korea needs to do a little more of that. Okay. Looking towards innovation and empowerment, I had some interesting concluding thoughts on this. Um, you know, these days, in the past, when these chambers of commerce held HR-related seminars, it used to be that only HR directors and HR managers showed up. These days, when we hold HR-related seminars, guess what? It's all the business leaders and the managing directors who show up because no one really knows what they're doing. Even if McKinsey, Bain, and all the, the, the thought leaders are publishing papers, it, the, the facts or the, the figures that are published quickly get outdated. So I think it's, this is an opportune time for Korea, as we have a new government coming in, we're, you know, just coming out of COVID, that we, there should be a lot more flexibility, there should be a lot of um, attention paid to this new way of looking at the whole employee employment relationship. Okay, so I'll be talking a little bit more about this during the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Now we will welcome Mr. Kim Joo Jin, Managing Director of Solutions for Our Climate for the next presentation. He'll be presenting on the topic of the regulatory challenges of renewable energy business in Korea. Please give him a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, as introduced, my name is Joo Jin Kim. I am the CEO of Solutions for Our Climate. Um, I guess a lot of people will not know um, uh, we are a climate advocacy and research group uh, based in Seoul, South Korea, uh, with about 50 staffers in the team, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions of Asia, making the Asian climate policy scheme consistent with the Paris Agreement 1.5 degrees goal is our objective. Um, I also, it's, it's, it's a very big pleasure to be here uh, at an AmCham host event. I was, uh, my pre career previous to uh, establishing this organization was in, in the legal, I worked for one of the major law firms in Korea, and uh, AmCham was a place that uh, we, uh, our team often ventured to. Um, today, I will talk, I would like to talk about a rather specific issue on what the renewable industry is facing, what especially many U.S. companies are facing in Korea in relation to their renewable and climate ambitions. Uh, it may be a little different from, from the topics that were discussed uh, before, 
Before, but before going into the details, I just wanted to show you a couple of business trends. Uh, this is data published by the IEA on what kind of energy investments, what kind of electricity sector investments are made, were made in the past year. Uh, you can see coal, gas, fossil fuels are going down, not just because of climate, but, but because renewables are just so cheap. Um, and this is, uh, this is another slide on, on what kind of uh, renewable, what kind of energy, electric sector, sector investments have been made in the past year. You can see the green part is big, that's all renewables. The gray part on top is uh, basically transmission and distribution network investments. And then the light blue style, light, light blue column there is, is nuclear. And it, it's, 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 it, 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 from a business perspective, it's, it's, it's sort of a pity that our government, our political scene is divided on that small part of the global energy economy because it's really small. It's not, it's not that area where the future of the energy industry lies. It's, it's the renewables and it's the grid business that where the, renewable, where the future of energy industry lies. So I, I hope uh, our, our, this political discussion kind of concludes in a favorable manner and, um, and uh, go on to uh, my next slide. Um, unfortunately, Korea, Korea has, a, has a very bad record when it comes to renewable energy, um, despite the global trends, which represents the cost, the technology change in the energy industry. It's, it's not that much different from 5G phones emerging. Uh, we are very late. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a, a well-known UK-based uh, think tank published a report saying that the global solar plus wind penetration average global, not OECD global, is 10, 11%. Korea's solar plus wind penetration is only less than 5%, 4.7%, I, I recall, uh, which means that we are way backward than the global trends. And it's becoming a risk to Korean businesses, not just our energy business, but also manufacturers, because committing to the climate is something that a business has to do. Um, we see there are two reasons why this is happening. Number one, outdated physical permitting, construction permitting schemes, basically. Um, I won't go too much in detail to this topic because number two, the second issue that I put on the bottom here is the main topic. But uh, this is basically the fact that we are, we are using permitting schemes that are too, I would say, delegated to, to, so, uh, to, to uh, subnational governments, provincial governments, municipal governments. We have 150 different sets of solar power plant permitting schemes the wind shore, wind, offshore wind permitting scheme is the Wild West still. And there has to be a level of government preemption there. And the result of this lack of government, central government leadership, which is, really, which is Korea's success story. We had our, our success stories about central government uh, coming in and, 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 and making the direction calls, uh, is, is, is here. I mean, only 0.6% of land is available for solar power plant development in some provinces, and many provinces probably, many municipalities. Um, but the bigger question here is, is about the market structure. We have a typical monopoly situation, monopoly problem where the company, where, where the problem, where, where the innovation, the lack of innovation happens, where the uh, company that owns the network, the monopolized network, is also inside, inside the generation, the content production business. And because of their tendency to protect their own assets, um, are the other innovative industries, innovative, innovative renewable or any, any sources are, are seeing, um, are seeing uh, 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 disadvantages. And I think the Jeju case really, really represents intuitively that example. Jeju Island has a, has a very strong tradition of you know, trying to be carbon free. And because of that, they have a lot of renewables. It's also a small grid. It's, it's an isolated grid, basically, uh, with, small, with, a, with limited, limited connection with the mainland. Um, and, and its average load is about 600 megawatts. Um, not that big, about 2%, 1% of Korea's um, whole load. And it has enough renewables to fit that uh, whole load. Um, 800 megawatts of renewables. So theoretically, if the wind and solar situation is perfect, Jeju could be 100% renewables. It's common to see 60% uh, renewable penetration in Jeju nowadays. Um, um, and, but it also has about 900 megawatts of fossil fuel power plants. And the difference, the important point is that the ownership is different. The fossil fuel power plants are owned by our national utility, KEPCO, whereas the renewable power plants are owned by many different companies, mainly private companies, individuals. So for KEPCO, 
which owns 100% of its shares of its Gencos, paying to the gas power plants or the oil power plants is a money circulation inside the system, but renewables, it's going outside the financial system of KEPCO. So there is a conflict of interest here. Um, and at the same time, and, and, and above all, is there a technology, and what's happening in Jeju is, is that renewable power plants are being curtailed. Um, and instead of renew, and, 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 and the reason why that's happening is because to, is to protect the grid and the, 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 the means that is used to protect the grid is operating the gas power plants and the oil power plants owned by KEPCO down there. Um, is there a technical solution not to do this? Yes, there is. Batteries, real-time markets, virtual power plants, all difficult technical terms. I won't go into the details of that. Are all available? And does, does our national utility KEPCO know? Of course, because I know as well. Um, why is this happening? Why, why, why is this happening? This, basically, this is happening because the entity that should control access to the grid and compensation when an electricity source comes into the grid is also doing the generation business. Um, I mean, first of all, I want to go to the question is, I, I, think, I think I partly mentioned this is, what will happen? Who will lose money if gas power plants are curtailed, uh, renewable power plants are curtailed less and gas power plant capacity factors go down? Obviously, our national utility will lose money. Second question, who controls grid access and reliability standards so, and, and compensation when electricity comes into grid? Um, there's an organization, a spin-off of KEPCO 20 years ago called uh, Korea Power Exchange based in Naju that does this. It should have been, it, when it was incepted um, 20 years ago, uh, it was based on the PJM model, the um, model of US um, ISO, Independent Smart Driver Operator, and it should have been independent. But what's actually, actually happening in, in, in the region is that um, the Korea Power Exchange's, the voting right of Korea Power Exchange's member meeting, so practically a shareholder meeting, and its board meeting is practically governed, is practically dominated by the national utility where you can see it, so, which, which leads to a situation where it's very difficult for the management of the system operator of Korea, Korea Power Exchange, to make decisions favor not favorable to the national utility, especially those that would hinder the cash flow of the fossil fuel power plants or the nuclear power plants owned by Korea Electric Power Corporation. And this, this kind of, this table, kind of technical, shows that, that kind of difference. Grid balancing is a service, the balancing service of grid is basically frequency management. The grid always have to have, has, has also always has to have a constant frequency. And there, there are roughly three ways to do that. I mean, there are a lot more other ways to do that, but I mean, just to mention uh, the three ways here, um, gas power plants can, can, does that role. A hydro, small hydro plants does that role. And battery system does that role. Battery systems usually combine with renewable power plants. Uh, the Korea Power Exchange, until now, until quite recently, did not have a pricing system for battery systems, uh, which kind of shows that where that their 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 tendency to not not support the renewable energies, um, and this is pretty much the situ situation where uh, um, many U.S. companies, many Korean companies as well, are experiencing when trying to develop renewable businesses through a PPA scheme, through through direct power purchase agreements with renewable developers. I'll go to that later on. Um, direct purchase of power purchase, direct power, power purchase of renewables through uh, uh, power purchase agreements has been a big trend, especially in the U.S. Um, you can see here the upward trend of, of uh, corporate PPAs, uh, corporate renewable pr purchases through power purchase agreements. Um, U.S., uh, Canada has been, is a big portion of it. Europe as well. Asia is small, and that kind of represents the uh, the global the situation that Asia has. It, many of Asia's power markets are vertically integrated and are, 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 are experiencing similar problems as, that, as those I will explain right now and just explain right now. Um, of course, the Korean government has responded to this demand for renewable purchase directly by corporates. Um, the Korean government has provided around four ways to, for a company to, to attribute its power use as renewables. Um, the first way is, is purchasing green premiums. The second way is to purchase uh, renewable energy credits, RECs. The third way is to enter into direct or indirect trilateral power purchase agreements. Uh, indirect power purchase agreements must be entered into via 
uh, KEPCO, Korea Electric Power Corporation. Uh, however, the reality is a bit different. Um, first of all, uh, green premiums or REC purchases up there are purchases for basically from existing projects. So there's, there's no, no new additional investment aspect. There's, there's not that much new additional investment aspect to this. Um, and above all, there, I mean, as, as this slide here shows, the consumption of, of energy, electricity, by many of our big companies way exceeds the level of solar and wind power available currently in, in Korea. So green premiums and REC purchase from that perspective is, is, is sort of a, is, is already an unrealistic uh, option, uh, which means that PPAs, direct or indirect PPAs are the answer. But the problem with direct and indirect PPAs is that it's not being used. Most of the KRE100, the, RE100, the, the renewable attributions uh, under the Korean regulatory scheme have been made until now, which is still very limited, under the green PM premium scheme and, and the green pre, the trilateral PPA or the direct PPA scheme has been barely used. Um, and my, my assumption there is that who would want, I mean, which company would not want, which, which company would, would hate the most um, having, uh, have making Samsung's or Apple's or, or other IKEA's, other companies like that uh, coming to their market, purchasing renewables directly from producers, I mean, non-KEPCO uh, uh, producers, obviously, Korea Electric Power Corporation national, or National Utility will, will be the most unwelcoming of those direct purchases because it will be a direct uh, reduction of its cash flow. Um, this, is, this is another slide that shows the, the sort of technical trends of, of, of indirect, of trilateral TPAs. Uh, what, what's happening here in, in our regulatory scheme is, is, uh, is, 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 is that Korea Electric Power Corporation is planning to charge a very big hike when a company wants to purchase uh, uh, in renewable energy via KEPCO uh, from a renewable energy producer, uh, they, the company will have to pay 60% more than the industrial power purchase price, which, which makes it very unrealistic uh, um, to do that. And, and this is one of the reasons why many of our conglomerates haven't been able to commit to a renewable energy 100% future. Um, it also, it, it, there's also an equity issue here because does the same thing, does the same, um, so does the same grid access charges, does the, 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 do the same incidental costs apply to, uh, apply to uh, KEPCO-owned plants, KEPCO-owned fossil fuel plants? No, it does not. Uh, these schemes only apply to renewable energy, and there's an equity issue there. So, so wrapping up, um, the, la the point I would like to mention is that the Korean government should listen to both Korean and multinational corporate demands for renewable energy. This is not a demand limited to US corporations. The Samsungs and POSCOs and the LGs of Korea also have a similar demand. I was, I was discussing with the transition committee members, a couple of uh, transmission committee officials a couple of days ago, and they were saying that they were surprised to see requests from the industry asking for better access to renewables, seeing the trends, the different trends. Um, it's also a rare moment when the business Multinational, Korean, all together, and environmental groups have a very small, same voice. Um, I mentioned about the transition committee. There was a recently a meeting between the transition committee and climate advocacy groups in Korea. And the key word of that discussion, except for climate, was KEPCO. That KEPCO is really, really hindering the renewable development and our climate targets. Um, as a short-term move, the Korean government can remove the excessive grid access costs the technical difficulties our renewables is uh, uh, our renewable related regulations are imposing um, and introduce more competition and increase the feasibility of the, power, uh, the the flexibility of the power market the Korean government should also understand that as long as the same company that does generation business also operates a monopolized network there will be a tendency to protect the legacy assets which is nuclear wind i mean nuclear solar uh, nuclear coal or gas. That should be addressed. And there has to be a level of, I would say, separation of that structure, a reform of that structure. Um, and both Korean and international companies should think about appealing this uh, to more collectively and organize, in an organized manner, appealing this to the Korean government. Um, I think there are many ways to do that. Um, uh, for example, this is typical business that, um, this, this monopoly business is typical business that our Fair Trade Commission handles. Um, so this is something that I think, uh, I, I, I think um, businesses 
present here, or um, not just Korea, international business, but also Korean business you should consider. And, and, and the last point I would like to mention is, I mentioned about the difficult siting regulations. Those uh, siting regulations have to be preempted with central government lead leadership. Um, so th these, are, uh, th these are my points for today. Um, once again, thank you very much to AmCham and the event partners for inviting me. Um, and um, I, I, also, I, I all hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the presenters. Now we will be moving on to the next segment, the panel discussion. The panel discussion will be moderated by senior attorney Yi Myung-jae from Yulchon LLC, who will be joined by three experts. Mr. Kim Tae-kyung, senior consultant from GR Korea, Ms. Christina Ahn, managing director of Morgan Phillips Korea, and Mr. Kim Ju jin managing director of Solutions for Our Climate. Please help me welcome all the participants to the stage. Okay. Hello, everyone. And my name is MJ Lee, and I'm a partner of Yulchun LLC, the law firm based in Seoul. And uh, before coming up to here, and uh, I received a very important mission and uh, from Amcham officer. We shouldn't, we we should shorten our time and of the panel discussion to give you enough time for lunch. And uh, okay, I will try my best. And uh, as he he already like uh, introduced our panel panelists today and uh, so we can like uh, directly move to the main topic and uh, our discussion topic is the how to unlock korea's next phase of innovative economy and with this topic and with this like excellent panelist today we would like to discuss about key reform agenda for the new korean government we already listened to each panelist presentation and uh, beginning this panel discussion, we would like to give each panel three minutes to recap key points of the presentation or you can share your additional views of the, your subject area if you have uh, missed some points in your presentation. And, uh, so, Mr. Kim, and uh, you can start. Okay. 네, 안녕하세요. 저는 GR 코리아의 시니어 컨설턴트로 근무하는 김대경이라고 합니다. 시간을 좀 아끼기 위해서 바로 본론으로 들어가겠습니다. 그 우리 기업들이 대한민국 정부와 국회를 바라보는 공통적인 편견이 있는데요. 네, 행정부는 불통이고 국회는 너무 많은 규제를 만들어내서 규제 공화국이다라는 보통 편견 이런 편견들과 주장들을 하고 계십니다. 의견들을 주고 계시고요. 네, 앞서서 우리 그 산업부 정책관님하고 문중 상무께서 이제 행정부의 어떤 의지나 방향에 설명을 해주셨으니까 이건 간략하게 그냥 바로 생략을 하고 그 국회를 중심으로 한번 이야기를 더 추가를 한번 해드릴까 합니다. 국회에서 만들어지는 규제들은 대부분 이제 국민 일상생활과 관련된 안전 같은 또는 국가 안보 같은 이런 규제들이 대부분입니다. 예를 어, 예를 들어서 아까 말씀드린 안전 또 국민 일상생활과 관련된 거. 이런 규제들은 법안 심사를 통해 심사를 할 때도 무난하게 통과가 되고 의원들, 의원님들 입장에서도 의지를 갖고 추진하는 것들이시죠. 근데 이런 배경들을 좀 우리들은 이해를 하고 가야 됩니다. 그러니까 이런 배경들이 없으니까 기업분들께서는 국회를 상대하거나 행정부를 상대할 때 단순히 어떤 높은 분, 뭐 장관, 뭐 의원님들, 어느 뭐 간사, 위원장님들, 이거 높은 분들하고 만나서 이야기하면은 어떤 규제가 해결된다라고 이렇게 오해를 하고 계신 분들이 많습니다. 근데 이런, 해, 이런 접근 방식은 근본적인 해결책이 아니라는 거죠. 그러니까 접근하는 전략, 뭐 어떻게 이걸 설득할, 것에 대한, 설득할 것인가에 대한 내러티브가 매우 중요하다고 생각합니다. 이제 행정부는 아까 설명을 들어, 들으셨다시피 이제 규제 완화를 위한 노력들을 계속 노력을 하고 있고요. 국회도 이 국민 불편을 해소치지 않는 범위 내에서는 최대한 민간의 목소리를 정책에 반영하려고 합니다. 그러니까 이런 규제를 완화하려고 하는 여러 제도를 이용하면서 명분과 논리적인 설득, 어떻게 접근할 것인가 이 바탕이 돼야 되는 게 매우 중요하다고 생각합니다. 이따 토론에서 계속 할 텐데요. 이런 토론을 통해서 또 의견을 교환해서 또 많은 아이디어가 나오길 기대하겠습니다. 감사합니다. Then next, Christina. Um, I actually didn't prepare a recap. But I think um, if I could just have top three key agenda items for the new government, 
Um, number one would be the revision of min minimum wage to make it a little more flexible by industry and region. And I believe that the president elect is already working on this. Number two is really addressing the aging society um, issue by adjusting perhaps the, reti the mandatory retirement age. And also lastly, um, you know, obviously this new government will have to focus on um, sustainable job creation, but I hope that, as I mentioned during my presentation, that this could be in line with this new way of looking at employment and the rise of the gig economy. Um, Zhu Jin Kim. Thank you. Um, uh, I think uh, my points will be quite similar to what I just mentioned. Um, some may want to say that uh, the reason why renewables are not working is because of we don't because we don't have sunlight or wind, or because public acceptance is not good. But um, the reality is that this is all a regulatory problem. Two regulatory problems: one is the physical permitting side; the other is the market structure, market regulation, mostly related to the monopoly of the of Korea. I talked a lot about the market structure. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, maybe I can supplement a little bit about um, the physical permitting side. As I mentioned, there is no central government policy on renewable power plant construction, despite the in, in, uh, industrial importance of renewable industry. Uh, the Korean government is almost fully delegating to the municipal government governments the permitting scheme related to renewables. And they're using a permitting scheme that was usually typically used for housing or, or buildings. So it's not right. Uh, it's not compatible with, with infrastructure like solar or wind, wind offshore or onshore wind plants. And this is also, this full delegation is creating a situation where municipalities are too exposed politically to the local sentiment, opposing any kind of development, which is often combined with intentions to extract compensation from deep pocket investors. Um, this has led to policies practically prohibiting municipal governments uh, um, from solar power development. So they would cite the, the assemblies of municipal governments would, would, would enter it, would enact citing regulations, which make it practically difficult, practically impossible for solar power plant development purely for their convenience, because they don't want to get, they don't want to get too much into the disputes related to solar development. And, 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 and our government, central government has been neglecting that situation for the past uh, um, uh, six, seven years. Um, and I think um, in order for our government to become a climate leader, it should look into details. The devil is in the details. And, um, and the central government should preempt the Wild West of renewable permitting. And I also ask companies together to strongly raise concerns about this. This is something that we are trying to do with the renewable energy industry, Korea, and also environmental groups. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, now I will ask each of you some question. And uh, Christina first. And uh, Christina, I, I know you are the like uh, HR and labor and the uh, specialist. And you summarized very well about the today, like uh, from your presentation, our labor market and the workforce and the environment and situation. And uh, that's very good. And my question is the, you know, everybody here knows the in Korea labor area, there is many, many issues. And the uh, number one, and we have the like a uh, weekly 52 hours working hours system. And also we have a, uh, in the, like a very traditional long-term, very serious, like uh, industrial relations with the labor union. And also recently there is also the serious like a puni the punishment act regarding the serious accident. So for the new government and uh, from your working experience, which area the government should tackle first and what should be their top priority agenda? And uh, how do you think? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm fully qualified to comment on this, on this question. Um, I think when we talk about labor issues, we largely deal with um, a lot of Korean companies and labor, um, Korean labor in non-multinational Korean companies. But like I said earlier, I think um, look a different way of looking at all the the policies that were the labor policies that were instituted during 
the previous government, such as minimum wage and 52 hour work week, um, is definitely necessary for this new administration to be more business friendly. Okay, thank you. And in the presidential election, Krishna, and also as you know, the gender conflict, yes, especially between the young man and young woman, was very serious. And uh, we all know this is very sensitive area. And uh, however, for the new government, if they want to approach and this issue, gender conflict issue, how do you recommend and what they should do? Right. And as I was talking um, during my presentation, if you think about how this whole focus, extreme focus on diversity and inclusion started, it was with the whole Black Lives Matter, the racial tensions in the U.S. a few years ago. Um, I think it's about time that Korea changed the dialogue or the focus, move away from gender and just focus on diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, because I think the media also exacerbates this issue. Like they like to pit one group against another. And I think if we are able to reformat or restage um, the discussion, um, then I think it will help to, to reprogram young people's minds to not just look at this dichotomized men versus women, but make it more into a, um, an inclusive discussion. You know, I have a daughter who's in junior high or in middle school, and she doesn't really care about gender no. issues at all, right? Like she just thinks that everyone's just an equal human being and that we should just be respectful towards everyone. So I'm hoping that maybe with the, the next, the Z, Gen Z generation, when they're in the, the workforce, that the way we look at gender will be very different. Wow. Krishna, I also have a daughter. She's just very sensitive on this matter. And oh, she's, yeah. she really cares. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Jujin, and uh, yeah, I have some questions for you. And uh, your presentation on renewable energy was very impressive. And uh, I also personally learned a lot. And uh, some part it was technical, but I guess some part I could understandable. In your presentation, you mentioned top buyers of renewable energy in the world today is mostly U.S. tech companies, and the, such as Amazon, Google, Meta, Microsoft. Why is it so? And what is the motivation or incentive and for those companies to do that? And uh, how about Korean company situation? Kakao, Naver, and the Samsung, and Hynix. And, uh, can you explain some? <clears throat> yes, certainly. Um, uh, the reason why um, many companies, not just the US tech companies, but also Korean companies, except for in Korea, um, are getting into this business is is because climate is becoming a very important risk. They understand that the Paris Agreement 1.5 degrees target, the space, space available for fossil fuel generation energy sources in that, in that trajectory uh, limits the space of these other power sources. And in, it's, it's a way to hedge the risk. It's also, a way to look, it's, it's also a way to look good. But above all, I think, I kind of suspect since, I'm, since we're at doing, the, doing, for doing business in Korea conference, I think it's because of the cost. Renewables are cheap. I've been hearing from Korean executives of conglomerates that they've been entering into renewable energy purchase agreements in places like the US or Vietnam at much more cheaper prices than what the industrial power purchase price, industrial pr prices in those countries. They can't do that in Korea. And that's why they're not happy. Mm -hmm. So also, Jujin, you also mentioned the uh, Capco, Hanjun, and the control the generation part. And also at the same time, they, they are controlling the networking and the grid and operation part. And uh, so for the new, like uh, coming, like a renewable energy provider, and uh, there is uh, some like a fairness issue, equity issue. And uh, so can you like uh, explain in other country, how, how about their situation? And is there some good example? They divide and so don't make 
without this kind of the equity or fairness issue? Yes. Um, in, in the U.S., the U.S. was a private-driven uh, uh, market, power market, but uh, still they also had the monopoly problem. There were big utilities that were vertically integrated. So they owned the generation, the network, and, and, and the sales side. Uh, but with the emer emergence of other technologies, and back then in the 90s was, was, was cogeneration, uh, cogeneration, um, combined heat and power plants that were emerging, much smaller scale, different, different business, business model, uh, competing with the larger businesses. And as these emerged, and also a little bit of renewables probably emerged, fairness of access, fairness of pricing became an issue. And with that evolved the concept of an independent system operator. So this happened in probably in the late 90s. I'm not too much in the details of the US uh, power sector regulations, but probably in the late 90s, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, introduced the concept of, of independent system operators. And our, our government actually tried to benchmark that concept um, in the early 2000s after the IMF financial crisis. Um, uh, the Korea Power Exchange, which I just explained, was was benchmarking uh, one of the um, the U.S. the U.S. independent system operator model. The most typical, the most well-known U.S. system operator is PJM. Um, so it, it, there are many reference cases in the in Europe. Um, the same thing happened um, in, in the in the concept called unbundling. It, it happened um, in the late early, mid two thousands. Um, it, it was a movement from the na from the national governments first, and then the Euro European Union also took it and um, made it a requirement for all the European Union members. So it's, it's, it's something that happened. Also, um, there's a level of difference of, of independence of, and, and, and I would say different structures, but um, it's also a common, it's also a concept coming into Asia as well. Okay, thank you. And uh, now I move to the Daejeong. And uh, I know you are the, like a specialist in the government relations. And uh, today, you will, we, like from our colleagues, we listened about the reform agenda regarding labor area or renewable energy area. And also many colleagues in the floor and in the company, in the day-to-day -day operation, they having lots of this kind of like a reform agenda and targeting to government or national assembly. And from your experience, what is the really best approach to persuade government or national assembly in Korea. Can you explain? Yeah. 우리가 각 기업별로 또는 우리가 당면한 이 과제들을 해결하면은 사익 추구 외에 공익적으로 어떤 선악력을 선한 영향력을 줄 것인가? 그리고 국민 생활에 어떤 이익을 줄 것인가에 대한 논리적 설명이 필요합니다. 그러니까 규제 완화를 통해서 국민에게 피해가 간다라고 예측되는 건 의원님들이나 행정부에서는 양보할 수 없는 부분이죠. 그러면 이것 이런 위험에 직면했을 때 우리는 어떤 논리로 이걸 격파하고 회차 나갈까 설명해 드리면 회가 회사의 사익 추구뿐만 아니라 사회적 영향력을 봤을 때 공익적으로 발전 방향이다라는 점 하나 그리고 국민들에게 좋은 영향력을 미친다 그리고 세 번째로 혹시나 도태 가능성 있는 계층과는 어떤 방식으로 우리가 상생안을 마련할 수 있는지에 대한 설명이 될수 있다면 행정부와 국회를 설득하는 데 가장 좋은 논리적인 명분이 됩니다. 근데 이 바탕이 되는 그 우리 대한민국의 특징들을 좀 생각해야 되는데요. 우리가 그 드라마 오징어 게임 같은 거를 보면은 어 우리 뭐 깐부라는 표현을 쓰거나 깍두기라는 표현을 쓰죠. 그러니까 이런 문화가 있다는 것 하나. 속담에는 우리는 이제 콩 한쪽이라도 나눠먹 나눠 먹어야 된다라는 그런 이런 문화가 좀 대한민국에 깔려 있습니다. 그래서 상생에 대한 부분도 되게 강조할 수 있고요. 그리고 이, 이 컨센서스를 바탕으로 이게 소통을 통해서 정부와 정치권과 많은 수기가 이루어지도록 해야 됩니다. 그래서 이러면 이러면 이제 많은 시너지가 생기고요. 이 사업을 운영하는 환경도 갖춰지면서 국회와 행정부가 원하는 공익적 가치를 달성할 수 있기 때문에. 이렇게 어떻게 전략적으로 소통할 수 있는가, 어떻게 자리를 마련하는가, 어떻게 접근할 수 있는가가 매우 중요하다고 다시 한번 강조 한번 드리겠습니다. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Krishna, and the uh, last question for you. And uh, now uh, our society is moving to the aging society. And you also mentioned about the gig economy and the so short-term freelancer and alba and that kind of the the job is growing. 
근데 as you know the our labor system is the prepared basically targeting permanent employee and the whole life employment and the, that kind of system. And uh, so now the situation is changing. And uh, I believe then the, our new government mm -hmm. and, uh, also they should prepare for this kind of change or new trend. Right. How do you think in this area? Um, you know, being in the recruitment industry, I, the trend that I see now is young people these days in their 20s and early 30s. They don't want lifetime employment. They don't want to be permanent employees. They actually prefer to be freelancers. Mm -hmm. They um, place a lot of emphasis on their own time and work-life balance. Um, it's actually the, the aging society part, the older workers who need to do that paradigm shift, mm -hmm. the mind shift, and I think we can take a lesson from what's going on in Europe, especially, which is also an aging society or um, yeah, societies, and also starting in the US as well, um, interim management. Mm -hmm. So what we used to know as like temping, right? Like temp, like if, a, if you're a temp in the US, it means you're sort of like a, a like low wage and you just kind of get outsourced but in europe and in the us now there's a new trend where um these senior very senior workers who have done their service in their lifetime employment they're maybe right at the retirement age but not quite ready to retire um they're Th that whole industry of interim management where they go in and work on a major company project for like six months to 12 months mm -hmm. on a project basis, that's really picking up steam. So I think that if the, uh, the new government can somehow incentivize um, companies to take advantage of programs like that, I think that would be very helpful. Yeah. It's, I think it's the same to everyone these days. Also, I dream for the freelance position with the same level of compensation, right? Okay. And, uh, and the Chujin, and uh, you know, the, like, uh, I think your explanation was very appealing and very logical. And uh, however, everybody knows in Korea, the Hanjun Capco is a public company and uh, they have a very dominant position. So, from day one, like, uh, it would be very difficult to demand them, yeah, you, you stop to touch this renewable energy section and uh, withdraw from this renewable energy business. And it would be very difficult to say so. And uh, so if you pick just one and the recommendation and the, to the new government regarding this renewable energy area, which, which like, uh, solution do you suggest and recommend in practical way in Korea? I would, I, I, I mean, the, the, the immediate way would, to, would be to make direct power purchases more viable for companies, not just like Samsung, I mean, not just like Apple, but also Samsung, Hyundai Motors, and things like that. Uh, but I frankly speak, that won't be possible unless you make that system operator uh, um, independent. And the easiest way with low cost to do that is to change the governance. And the governance is not required under the law. There's no law saying that you have to have three KEPCO associated directors inside the board meeting of Korea Power Exchange. You don't need 99% of voting rights owned by KEPCO inside the uh, Korea Power Exchange member meeting. It's not inside the law. It's not inside, I, I don't think it's inside the presidential decree or a presidential uh, um, regulation or a ministerial regulation. So they can change that and give a lot more room to our system operator to, to bring in creativity and flexibility in how our power market is operated, which will bring in battery sources, which will bring in a lot more direct PPAs. So changing the governance of that system operator is the easiest, most cost-effective way to deliver change. Okay, thank you. So thank you. So from your experience or from your company experience, 
Is there a real success story you can like, uh, introduce or you can share with us and uh, to persuade the government or National Assembly to change the regulation and those things? 어, 구체적인 회사들을 제가 지참할 수는 없지만 제가 몇 가지 사례들을 좀 설명을 한번 드려볼게요. 그 제가 아까 되게 전략적 소통에 대해서 강조를 한 케이스를 한번 설명을 드리면 이제 국제적인 산업협회와 관련된 이슈였는데 이제 행정부에서 고시가 발표가 됐어요. 근데 이건 대표적 규제였는데 제가 생각했을 때는 고시가 발표되는 과정에서 산업군과 업계의 입장이 충분히 전달되지 않았다. 그래서 충분한 토론이 이루어지지 않았다라는 판단이 들어서 이 견제 장치를 활용할까 아니면 대화의 장을 마련할까 여러 고민들 하다가 국회를 활용했어요. 경제 이제 견제 장치를 활용해서 업계의 의견이 충분히 담겨지지 않았고 토, 충분한 토의가 이루어지지 않았다라는 이제 문제 제기를 통해서 국회를 통한 견제 장치죠. 저 추가 논의를 이끌어내서 고시가 고시의 방향과 속도가 개정되는 그런 케이스가 있었죠. 이거는 되게 저희가 말하는 전략적인 소통. 두 번째는 이제 모멘텀을 살리는 것도 중요한데 우리가 근래 가장 모멘텀이라고 얘기할 수 있는 코로나로 인한 모멘텀 이를 기반으로 코로나라는 모멘텀을 이용해서 이제 내러티브를 짜다 보면은 이제 어뭐 예산뿐만 아니고 정부의 지원도 이끌어낸 이런 그런 케이스도 있고요. 그리고 이런 모멘텀이 사회적 이슈를 활용하는 모멘텀이면은 이제 행정부뿐만 아니라 여야 모두 합의를 이끌어낼 수 있는 아주 좋은 모멘텀입니다. 그리고 또 하나로 또 설명을 드리면은 정치적 모멘텀을 활용하는 건데요. 이제 인사청문회나 국정감사나 전체 회의나 이제 또 다른 케이스를 들면은 이제 이런 규제 여파가 이제 산업계 직접 피해뿐만 아니라 아까 제가 말씀드린 우리 공동체를 되게 중요시한다는 우리 대한민국의 특징을 활용하면 이 밸류 체인의 한 축인 소상공인들의 피해도 설명하는 케이스도 있거든요. 그러니까 사전에도 이 여론 조사를 하고 국정감사에서 인사청문회를 통해서 규제의 방향과 속도를 조 방향과 속도까지 수정하는 좋은 케이스고요. 이런 내러티브들이 이렇게 잘 만들면 은 여야가 입장을 달리하자는 논리가 되거든요. 그러면 행정부와 국회 모두에서 건설적인 논의가 되고 제가 원하는 목표들을 달성할 수 있는 좋은 케이스들이라고 설명할 수 있겠습니다. Okay. Thank you very much for your tips. And thank you very much. Now for five minutes and we will open the Q&A session to the floor. And if you have any questions, please raise your hand and tell, tell us your company. name and designated some like uh, among the panelists who you want to like uh, to ask is there any some questions okay 네, 사마이 법원의 유국회 교사라 그럽니다. 어, 저희 나라는 그이 기업의 자질이나 능력으로 봐 가지고 충분히 정부의 관여 간섭 없으면은 크게 잘 자랄 수 있는 그런 기업이 그 기업입니다. 어 그리고 또한 어 정부 정책 중에도 여러 가지 있지만 가장 중요한 거는 경제 정책이고 그런 면에서 이제 산업을 키, 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 키워야 하는데 그런 입장에서 보게 되면 기업이 자유롭게 활동할 수 있도록 해야 하거든요. 그렇기 때문에 새로운 정부에 들어서는 기업의 운영은 기업인의 자율적인 선택에 이름하게끔 이러한 정책이 필요한 거죠. 그런 점에서 봐가지고 과거 정부가 만들었던 여러 가지 규제 이거를 전부 검토해가지고 예, 조정한다든가 또는 철폐해서 자유롭게 기업에 자유롭게 운영할 수 있는 그런 역으로 환영을 만드는 것이 가장 중요하고 그런 점에서 보면 은 며칠 전에 이제 윤석열 대통령 당선인의 어, 광주를 방문했다고도 얘기했는데 여러 가지 정부의 규제를 제거해 가지고 자유로운 기업 활동을 하도록 하겠다고 이런 이야기를 했거든요. 우리나라 충분히 커서 있는 국제적으로 어, 정말 리딩을 할수 있는 이런 에, 국제 경제적인 조건을 가지고 있습니다. 그래서 이제 그 이, 기업들을 하여금 자유롭게 활동할 수 있게끔 정부가 잘 그, 이, 일이, 그, 이제 지원해야 한다고 생각하고 또왜 과거에 이렇게 그, 이, 잘못된 규제가 있었느냐 하면 은 국회의원들은 말하면 입법 활동을 했으면 은 그로 인해서 개인의 실종 인정, 인정을 받는다고 그랬거든요. 그러니까 사회적인 그 영향 같은 걸 생각하지 못하고 자기네 실천 반응을 위해서 뭔가 하나 만들려고 그러니까 
그것이 좋은 것이 아니고 기업을 규제하는 그런 면으로 있었단 말이죠. 사실 국회가 없지 않다 보니까 그런 얘기 나와요. 그래서 이러면서 보게 되면은 이제 그 예, 말하면 정부 국회 구조라든가 그런 것도 변형이 되었고 앞으로 발전하는 부분이 만만 많다고 봅니다. 그러면 저희 나라는 정말 국제적으로 예, 원자력 부분도 있고 굉장히 발전할 수 있는 여건이 충분히 가진 나라입니다. 그런 면을 저희는 자랑할 수가 있습니다. 감사합니다. 예, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, he mentioned about the liberalization of the regulations and uh, more autonomy to the company should be given. And uh, so I don't think like uh, I thank you very much for your comment and feedback. And I don't think it requires some answers from the panelists. Okay? Yeah. I think uh, like him. And uh, if you have any comments and or like a thoughts or opinion to share with us and uh, Feel free to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, my name is John Kim. I'm a foreign partner at the law firm of Shin and Kim. I don't have a specific question for any of you, but more of a general one in the theme of doing business in Korea. Mm -hmm. For the four of you, what do you see as we are now exiting Corona, the COVID pandemic, and also with a new president administration coming in? What do you see as some key economic growth engines for South Korea as we proceed now with the remainder of the year and going forward. Thank you. Wow. Who, who, who can I comment on this? Like a very mega-sized yeah, question. And uh, yeah, but, but you know, the, everybody knows and maybe the, 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 our colleague who asked this Question also have some thoughts and the uh, good thing is the like uh, you know the these days like uh, good thing for Korea is we have some like a uh, very strong industry like uh, semiconductor and the electronics and the, these industry is very good and also these days like uh, those pharma industry is growing and also another one is the the kind of the entertainment industry is also very popular in everywhere in the world. And uh, so personally, like uh, I think here everyone has the same thought and that this new government team, if they emphasize this kind of very strong like uh, area of industry and uh, put their energy and focusing on that and make some development and then like uh, that could be very, very good for our next generation. And uh, I believe we all have the same thought. Okay. Do you have any more? Okay. And uh, then, thank you. Now it's time to wrap up. And uh, May 10 is the inauguration ceremony for our new president, Yoon Song Yeol. Whether you voted for him or not, regardless of it, and we all wish for the new government's success. And the new government's success would be the Korea's success. And, uh, and also, we wish the government open the way to innovative economy for Korea. And uh, let's see how it moves on. And thank you very much for today. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, this will be the end of, end of our seminar. I would like to thank all the speakers, presenters, and everyone who joined us today. Have a great day and stay safe. For those of you...